three, two, one, and we're live. Welcome once again to HeroQuest fans. Here on Twitch, this is we are live on Twitch. And if you're watching the replay on YouTube, uh, not live, it's just a replay, as the name implies. Uh, just one second here. Seems we always have some technical issue to deal with. I will just be right back. It's getting a little warmer out here, so we gotta contend with heat. Okay, so um, today's stream, as you might imagine, is going to be pretty much a talk stream. Pretty much a discussion stream as opposed to a game stream. And yes, I do prefer to do the game streams here in HeroQuest Fans, because it is about gaming. Um, it's fun, but um, we have some things to discuss, and a couple of things I just want to talk about real quick before I get into it. Yes, we will be focusing on the Barbarian Quest Pack, the Frozen Horror, originally released uh, through Milton Bradley, owned by Hasbro, of course, um, in connection with Games Workshop, Citadel Miniatures, and I don't think Stephen Baker had anything to do with this one, even though he is the credited as the lead designer for the original Hero Quest back in 89 and famously did Prophecy of Tellor for the remake. Well, anyway, as pretty much everybody knows by now, who's been looking at HeroQuest stuff in the last couple of years, um, they re-released HeroQuest with a redesign, but pretty much the same uh, rules, and the lore was 99% the same, um, and it's been speculated for a long time, and they were dropping hints, and then we've seen photos now of the Frozen Horror, the Barbarian Quest Pack is going to be remade. And it's, as you know from previous streams, if you've uh, listened to me before, I've talked about how, I mean, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge for them, I think. Because there are a lot of problems with this Quest Pack, even though it's a sought-after collector's item, and a lot of people have, you know, speculated and clamored and been excited for a remake of it. It needs a little bit of work. The miniatures are fine. You know, the ideas behind it are fine. Um, you know, the great thing about HeroQuest is they give you new stuff to work with. I mean, it's all about creativity. So people are going to take those miniatures and they're going to use them in their own custom-made quests. They're going to do whatever they want with them. They're going to use the new tiles to create new adventures. And the game itself encourages you to do that. I mean, that's why they give you the blank quest map. And they tell you, hey, go ahead and photocopy this if you need extra copies for your game. You know, permission is given, so it's all great. It's all great. But the general public, I mean, because we're hoping this will be a retail release, the general public is going to want the core quests to be playable. And if they're not, if they've got some problems with them, you're going to get some unhappy customers, and you're going to get some potentially bad reviews, and that might affect, because, you know, this is, it's still considered a, you know, a niche product. It's a small, nostalgic kind of thing. I mean, it's not just for collectors. I mean, HeroQuest is in retail again after 30 years. But it's going to affect future purchases. So they have a little bit of a challenge on their hands. Now, the best case scenario, they take these criticisms to heart. They do play testing. They make prudent changes to the game, uh, to the Frozen Horror specifically so that the quests work and then you know classic fans if they don't like the changes will just do whatever they want anyway which is what we could always do but the main product that most people buy uh will be playable and it'll encourage you know the community to continue to grow you know not just with people who remember hero quest back in the day and are getting back into it introducing it to their kids grandkids but totally new uh, players who want, you know, a fantasy board game that's easy to understand, easy to get into, into, and endlessly expandable, you know, even if they're not into uh, Warhammer Fantasy or Dungeons and Dragons or any of those other type of games, which are fine, but they're they're different. Hero Quest is is uh, is a board game, fantasy board game that that can introduce you to tabletop uh, role playing games, but it doesn't have to. It, it's its own thing too. So I think if they do it right, it'll be a great success. If they don't, they're going to have uh, a little bit of a challenge 
I could imagine them sending out emails and going on Twitter and Facebook and telling people, we're sorry, we're sorry, here's some fixes, here's some errata corrections, here's some suggestions to make it more fun. And the fan community is, we've been doing that already. We're going to do that no matter what. Someone comes on and goes, ah, this is broken. And instead of saying, get good, you know, we're going to say, well, have you considered this list of suggestions? And maybe instead of returning it, sending an angry letter to Hasbro, they're going to go ahead and just play it. But I think if they head it off beforehand, they're going to be doing better. Now, I'm not going to repeat all the stuff that I've said from previous streams because, I mean, I've gotten a little bit of criticism that, hey, I just, I sound like I'm repeating myself. I just, you know, I have my list of suggestions, list of problems. And I've done two streams where I pretty much repeated the same stuff. I mean, I tried to vary it and, and include new things that we'd learned. But anyway, so that's, that's the preamble to the Barbarian Quest Pack that we're going to be talking about here today. Um, there's a few things. Let me just check the stream here. So the weather is nicer. So welcome to Gasan PL. Haven't seen you in a while, so welcome back to the stream. Let me just check the sound here. Are we doing okay as far as sound and video? This looks okay to me. Okay, so yeah, we're discussing the Barbarian Quest Pack, which is known as the Frozen Horror. Now, if you want to check out uh, a guy called Dead Gamer, you may have heard of him through uh, my stream. I have mentioned him quite often. Cool guy, really helpful when we were doing our unboxings. Uh, but yeah, Dead Gamer on YouTube. He, um, I think he has the actual quest book here for the Barbarian and Elf from back in the day. So, which is really cool because they're really rare and expensive these days if you're trying to track down a, an old copy. This is just a reproduction. This is just a reprint. And, you know, I just thought, hey, I'm just going to reprint this. And this is full of spoilers. So if you're afraid of spoilers, maybe don't don't watch the video for a while because we're going to be talking about that. If you want your own copy, though, if you want to look at this, it's not like you have to go on eBay and it's not like you have to, you know, pirate it. Um, Hasbro has had this online probably since the 90s. So if you go to Hasbro Customer Care, you're going to have to look around. It may be a little hard to find it, the PDF scan of the original Quest book. But if you go to your favorite search engine, let me just go ahead and show you here. I'm just going to have to hide the video so you can see. Okay, there's, our, there's us staring into infinity. Um, if we go, just search for Hasbro Frozen Horror Quest book or Barbarian Quest Pack Quest Book. And it's, look, it's the second it's the second result, Hasbro.com. Now, if they take this down, I mean, they shouldn't uh, because they've had it up all this time. Everybody's had a chance to get it. But you can actually look at what we're talking about. Let me see if you can see that. Yeah, I want to share my PDF as well. So let me just... Oh, I know. I can just click on it here. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, yeah, just get your favorite PDF viewer out there, and you can take a look. So that's, I mean, it's a crude photocopy, but that's the official one. <laughs> so if you were ever curious, I mean, back in, I think, 2002, I downloaded this from... Uh, Hasbro's own site, and I'm like, oh yeah. So spoilers from here on. So you can learn all about the contents of this quest pack long before the remake comes out, because chances are, and many people have, I mean, I'm not a betting man, but if I were, I'd probably be out a lot of money, because chances are they're going to take this and pretty much just re-release it, you know, re remove the usual references to Warhammer Fantasy stuff, and um, it'll be the same, but that's the problem because there are some issues. Now, one question is, okay, what about the female barbarian? Many of you remember the uh, pledge drive, which frankly, most fans never even got to participate in that because by the time they heard about it, it was already too late. 
um, there was a, a package of alternative heroes. So you had the female versions of the wizard, barbarian, uh, dwarf, and you had the male version of the elf. Because in the original game, the elf was male. But you got a female elf in the elf quest pack. So it'll be interesting to see if they make it to Mage of the Mirror and remake that. Will we get the male elf? Because he's the one that's missing. Because the the general public didn't didn't get that one. But they already have the female elf because she's included in the uh, retail version. I mean, there's no difference. They made the characters exactly the same. The only thing that's different is the miniature. So if you want to have a female character, it's a little cooler to have a actual female uh, miniature. Now, they hardly made them different at all. I mean, the, the chest and the arms are slightly different size and the you know, there's maybe a beard or lack of a beard, but um, yeah, it, the original idea behind these um, these two quest packs, the elf quest pack and barbarian quest pack, is that you got a female version of one of the heroes. And you also had a, as I showed you earlier, you have this between quests, you can buy potions. So there's this alchemist shop. That was something you saw in Keller's Keep in Return of the Witch Lord. Now in the remakes, Instead of just putting it on a chart here, although they did that as well, they actually gave you cards. And it doesn't matter if you run out of cards, but the idea is, oh, you, you can just look at these cards and buy these potions in between. And they do say specifically that some of them are only for one hero, so only the barbarian can use these. Just like in the elf, you know, there was exclusives for the elf. Um, but... They also said if you own other quest packs, you can buy those potions in between. And here you start to get into a little bit of a question because in this in this stream, I'm going to be talking about the cutting room floor. I'm going to be talking about the drafts. The drafts were leaked. I mean, they're not really leaked because I guess the non-disclosure agreements the designers signed have expired now. And so they the notes ended up online. Uh, some people purchased them and scanned them, and Luca Pashi is spearheading the group now, who is sifting through those notes, looking for anything interesting that the community could use, anything cool for maybe a fan project to kind of recreate some of the stuff that wasn't released. Because uh, I've talked about this a little bit before, so it's not a big secret, but the uh, Dwarf Quest Pack and the Wizard Quest Pack were planned. But the pro the project was sacked um, in sometime in 1992 or maybe 1993, and so we never got those other two packs. But there would have been a very similar kind of thing. I mean, drafts exist, and I'm not going to show those drafts in this stream. And in fact, just for um, I mean, I have I basically agreed with um, Luca Pashi and some of the other people that are working on this. Is we're going to try to keep it a surprise about those other two packs, just only release a few details. And then eventually there will be something that people can actually play. It'll be an attempt, you know, best guess, to kind of fill in the gaps, because those two weren't quite finished. But the Barbarian Quest Pack and the Elf Quest Pack, we actually have notes from the designers, which is it's really cool to read. It's really cool to go through that those historical documents and see and kind of get inside their head a little bit and try to imagine like what they were thinking because they're working on this project in like 1991 um and they're on a schedule and there's very few of them and they're writing notes back and forth and sometimes they get a little feisty <laughs> you you see like sarcastic comments and like little jokes that go on and uh now a project like that today would be much easier because you'd have a lot more you know instant communication you could do you know, video chats and, and all that sort of stuff. But back in 91, 92, they would have had, yeah, some online stuff, but mostly they'd be like sending stuff to each other through the mail and, you know, handwritten notes, high, a lot of highlighting, red pen kind of stuff, hand-drawn things. And they were, they were clearly drawing from the European quest packs. So from Wizards of Morcar, which was all about, you know, these super wizards, that, that's well that Morikar, which was the European name of Zargon, the evil game master, uh, evil wizard player. He hires these super wizards to try to kill the heroes, and it's a short little pack, and it's mostly just fun stuff, you know, new miniatures and things. They they had access, the design team had access to that, and they were taking certain ideas from that pack because hey, people in North America, 
United States didn't didn't you know didn't even know about that much less had a chance to play it most of them you know unless oh my dad you know came back from his business trip and brought me this cool obscure hero quest thing that's how some people got it or maybe you know you had some friendly local game store that had oh european games and here's this hero quest expansion that nobody knew about um the other one was uh the against the ogre horde and that had you know some unique miniatures and interesting stuff but again european ex exclusive american players had no idea it existed you know if you were 10 years old you didn't know about it back then but they were looking at photocopies of that stuff and taking some ideas from over there but anyway i'm really interested in the cutting room floor stuff i'm really interested in the draft stuff and specifically what i was looking for because they can do whatever they want of course they may make no changes or fixes at all they may make some changes that are completely original or maybe they'll look back in the archives and you know base their work on what was done in the past but i just wanted to see did they have any fixes for for those issues back in the day and the answer is yes in some cases they did uh, but in some other cases they didn't so i know we've been looking at this picture for a while so let's kind of change it up here so again this this right here is not from the stash of scanned documents that luka Pashi and and company have rather this is hasbro's own document that we're looking at here uh, hasbro customer care had this uh, up since the 90s and now you can see in my tabs here that i've got some other documents there and i'll be showing some of these again respectful of their desire to kind of release it as a surprise but um keep in mind this is for the barbarian quest pack frozen horror so this has nothing to do really with the wizard quest pack and the elf quest or the dwarf quest pack but really they're all kind of cut from the same mold they all have the same basic outline and i've said this before you start out with three quests first three quests are solo and they're focused on that specific hero going by him or herself and the idea was they say well here let's look at the text itself i mean this is what the final version looks like minus you know some of the color because it's black and white so the adventure continues the barbarian quest pack is an expansion set used with your original hero quest game system so you start with the original that everybody has you must have the game system in order to play the adventures in this booklet plastic figures one female barbarian six mercenaries now we know already that there's going to be 12 mercenaries in the remake and the reason they did that is originally they were going to have interchangeable weapons so similar to space crusade you know you've got these bolt-on hands you know holding different weapons so that you can choose which one you want but you have more weapon choices than you have like bodies to put them on but since the remake is using you know pre-assembled figures that are this kind of bendy plastic that are glued already it made sense that they would just have one figure for each weapon so there's 12 of them but the good thing about that and maybe they didn't realize this is that they're going to be making the game a bit easier because the difficulty in this version is extreme these are the hardest official hero quest quests ever released much harder than any other pack so if you thought <clears throat> return of the witch lord was difficult this one will blow you away and really there's a couple of issues with the the first three quests which if they could fix those it would make the pack like infinitely more enjoyable because once you get through those cheers dead gamer once you get through those first three quests, things get a lot easier because you've got all four heroes together, working together, and you can buy these mercenaries. You can hire, they call them hirelings, they call them men-at-arms, but they're mercenaries. So these guys will follow you around and, and help you with some of the fighting. And since you've got twice as many that potentially you could buy, that'll help a lot. But those first three quests are going to be brutal. So you got three ice gremlins um, i'm just gonna sprinkle throughout so with uh, little details originally they were they were called ice gremlins but uh, alternately the writers uh, and the designers and their notes called them ice goblins and they do resemble goblins but they're way stronger i mean they have three body points goblins only have one and the whole point of those is they can steal your gear and then there's the polar two polar war bears there's a bit of a problem with those characters Originally, they just called them polar bears, but quickly they were changed to war bears. Two yeti, 
Now the Yeti is a big problem because he's basically got a, an attack that can kill you uh, in those solo quests. The Frozen Horror, which is the final boss character. And there's 30 game cards. Now it's already been confirmed that there's going to be 35 game cards. And the reason for that is more, most likely just because they put the potions on uh, equipment cards. And there might be an alternate hero card for the Barbarian. Makes sense. And the cardboard tile sheet. So I'm going to switch over just, just momentarily and show you. You've probably seen these already. These have been posted all over social media and, and elsewhere. But let's see here. Okay, so switching back to the browser. Okay, so there's this one. This is of the Barbarian Quest Pack components for the remake. So you can see it's a little closer, more close up than before. So that's supposed to be, I mean, still with the shadows and everything, it is, is that a female barbarian? We're guessing yes. She's just a little bulked up and she's got a lot of gear on. But it almost looks like she's got like kind of a midriff thing going, even though, you know, she's in the ice and snow. I guess she's that tough. And you've got the uh, mercenaries. So you can see there's three of these uh, long sword carrying or uh, swordsmen which are really strong. You've got the scouts in the middle with the sword and shield. There's three of them there. That's just rotated. It's, it's the same pose. They're all identical. Um, those appear to be female. I'm just going by the chest armor there and the hair. Of course, you get a lot of long-haired uh, heroes. And then you've got these crossbowmen, which I can't really tell if those are supposed to be male or female. But there's three of them, and they're in a crouched position. And then you've got halbeard, halbeard ears, which it's funny reading the designer notes for the drafts of the Barbarian Quest Pack. And thanks again, by the way, Luca Pachi, for releasing those and giving me the okay to, to talk about them here on the stream and even show a little bit, just a little bit. Not trying to make anybody jealous or anything. I think they call it flexing. It's like you're flexing online. It's like, nah, it's not, not what I'm trying to do. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, in the designer notes, um, the editor, and I'm not going to use their full names just because I'm not sure, you know, if, if that's proper or not, but Mike, Mike G is the, was the, I think the head editor and there's like a bunch of other people, there's Scott and Donna. So if any of those people are listening, shout out to you. I'm not diminishing the work you did on this. I think it's really cool that you did the, the work that you did. And I think it's really cool that these notes are kind of out there now. Um, and I hope, you know, you do get respect and credit for what you tried to do. I think, um, I don't blame you for the mistakes because Hey, mistakes happen. I mean, I love Phoenix. Phoenix has done a lot of cool, um, remakes of, of different quests and, you know, there's mistakes in a lot of quests and it's, it's really possible, especially when you have a small team like that to make those mistakes. I think if you'd been given more time, uh, I mean, I blame the parent company. I blame the company for not giving you enough time to play test the stuff. I think if you had more, um, maybe a couple extra people on the team to help edit, it could have been uh, better than it was. So I'm not dumping on any of those people. But I think here, um, Hasbro now has the opportunity to revisit these quests and make them even better. Not to say that what you guys did was wrong. I mean, the foundation's all there. It's just that there were just a couple of things that, and, and you almost had it right. <laughs> you almost had it. And just a little bit of revision could have made it even better. So, yeah, one of the editors um, was like, what's a hell beer deer? I don't know what that is. I can't find it in the dictionary. Um, so they suggested calling it the pikeman. But I think it eventually just became the hell beer deer again. As you can see in the in the final version. There was also some debate about why are these guys on monster cards? Well, the reason for that is because they're not just good guys. I mean, yes, you can hire them as mercenaries, but they can also be bad guys. So there's certain quests where it calls for Zargon to put out one of these characters and it's an evil, you know, evil human, an evil crossbowman or whatever. Now the question becomes, what about if you've hired all these guys as mercenaries? 
does that mean that that monster just doesn't doesn't fight you anymore? <laughs> Can the heroes make the quest easier by hiring like all 12 or all six in the original so that they won't have to fight those? Well, technically, and this was always true, Zargon can still put another monster to substitute. And it's totally up to him whether he wants to say, he or she, whoever the GM is, whether that new figure, you like, let's say it's an orc. It's like, yeah, I know it's an orc, but we're going to say it's a crossbowman or whatever. It's an orc with a crossbow. Or would you just say, yeah, we've just substituted. So yeah, instead of a crossbowman, it's an orc. Either way. But in the original, the idea was you use a monster of the same color. So it calls for a femur. You don't have any femurs. You throw in a goblin or whatever. Um, it's supposed to be a gargoyle, but you don't have any gargoyles, so you use a chaos warrior. Well, in this version, they say substitute a monster of similar strength because you'll notice they're almost all blue. So you're not going to throw in the frozen horror when it's supposed to be an ice gremlin because you see you got these other figures here. So there's a lot of stuff about that. Um, notice in this re these remake pictures, I mean, these appear to be actual physical plastic figures. These are not just 3D renders. So for all we know, this is what the final version is going to look like. Now, again, these photos were taken from social media, and they got them from pre-order sites from Scandinavia mostly. And the only thing that Avalon Hill was disputing was the price and the release date. So that's subject to change. But for all we know, this is what the final version will look like. So notice how they've got the blue doors. Originally, those would have been cardboard. You got the Frozen Horror. I think it's a cool looking design, but he's huge. And the base that he's on is round. So the question is, does that take up two squares? Because the original is two, a rectangle of two squares. The first big monster that we see that takes up more than one square or is it going to be like four squares? It almost looks like it would be four. And I'm thinking of Space Crusade with the Dreadnought boss that takes up four squares. But the thing with those big monsters is, I mean, if you're flanking the monster adjacent, normally you can only attack a monster that's adjacent to you. And yeah, as a little kid, I'm like, what's adjacent mean? I'm like, oh, it explains. You know, a facing square, a touching square, north, south, east, or west, up, down, left, right. Well, you could have two people in front of the monster, let's say, and they both get to attack him, and the monster can attack either one. See? You could be surrounding him on four sides, and um, he would still get to attack. Even if, technically, it would be like a diagonal, because normally monsters can't attack diagonally. I mean, diagonal attacks are a big deal. These pikemen can do diagonal attacks. So if you hire them, it's like, oh, cool. You know, you... You do this technique where you block the door. You put one guy in front of the open door, and the monster's on the other side, and then you get another guy on the edge who can stick his weapon in, through the doorway diagonally to attack the monster, but the monster can't attack that person back unless they have another monster on the other side who has a diagonal strike. Now, in theory, Zargon could have an evil pikeman on the other side who could poke back. So, you know, there's there's creative ways you could make it more interesting because a lot of heroes, a lot of seasoned heroes, they'll just block the door and it's it's not cheating. I mean, the the rule book tells you flat out tells you how to do this back in 1990 for the original game. So, you block the door, you put um, somebody on the side like the wizard with the staff or the anybody else with a long sword and they can just be poking away at monsters and the monster has very little chance to uh, get an attack in. And especially if it's the Barbarian and he's got armor, he's going to block the door. Now you've got these Ice Gremlins. I, I like the design of the Ice Gremlins. They gave them more beard, um, bigger beards. So going along with that icy theme. So they look kind of like Santa's elves gone bad or something. And they've got these icicle weapons that are kind of more like swords, icy swords or something. And then the Yeti, it's still, <laughs> they're not going to run afoul of any uh, copyright with uh, Disney, I don't think, with Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back. But, I mean, they do kind of remind you of the Yeti from Empire Strikes Back. But that's that's all the way back to 92. But they look a little less like Cookie Monster with horns. So I think that's that's fine. 
And then you've got the Polar War Bears, which just a more of a dynamic pose, but they pretty much look the same. Now, a lot was made of the fact that it looks like they're going to include a second set of combat dice, which is great. I mean, they're blue. Why did they make them look transparent in the picture? It's It doesn't quite make sense, but I think that's just a mock-up. But yeah, having an extra set of combat dice, we've talked about that before. You know, Zargon gets his own set of dice, the heroes get their set, and so you can roll them both and look at the results without having to get confused or re reuse the same die. I mean, reusing the same dice is no big deal. You could play this game with one combat die, and just you just keep re-rolling it and passing it around. But it's it's kind of a luxury feature to have an extra set. So people who pledged the Mythic tier got an extra set of dice, and this will be another opportunity for people to get that. That's great. Same distributions as the regular combat dice. Three skulls, two white shields for heroes, and one black shield for monsters. Or in this case, it it's like a negative image, so the black monster shield is actually white. But yeah, same same difference. Now, oddly, they gave you another set of movement dice. So standard D6 movement dice with the little pips on them, but it's blue. I guess just for fun. Because there's really no need for that. I mean, occasionally Zargon will need to roll a red die, you know, a regular die. Like, let's say a monster has a uh, ball of flame or um, fire of wrath, or fire of wrath, as the, they said in the UK commercials. Uh, it, the monster has that spell cast on him, and you're supposed to roll a die for, yeah, you, well, yeah. No, okay, there's a few other situations. So with sleep, they're supposed to roll one red die for each of their mind points. Most monsters don't have that many mind points, maybe like one, two, or three. But some of the bosses have, have bigger amounts of mind points. Gargoyles, I believe, have four. But yeah, you're supposed to roll a die. So yeah, okay, there's some situations where Zargon would be rolling those type of dice, and that would give him um, a different color, so red versus blue. You know, classic uh, matchup there. So no, no problems really with those miniatures, and I think they they do a fairly good job. And of course, they're trying to use new designs because Games Workshop's Citadel line was responsible for the original miniatures. And they're since uh, Games Workshop is not part of this project, you know, the the designs are inspired by, but not an exact copy of their old uh, designs. So let's look at some more pictures here. And again, I'm just flipping back and forth between the original and the remake. So a lot of this stuff has been covered by other people, but we will be getting into new stuff that nobody has covered yet. So uh, stick around for that. And again, not bragging, not boasting, just, just telling you. And I couldn't have done this without the help of others. So this has also been released. These are the remake, apparently, final designs. More than likely, because it's supposed to come out this year. Maybe in September? Again, Avalon Hill did, has not officially confirmed that, the official release date. But yeah, as you can see, very similar. You know, it's using that modern art style. So kind of pastel colors and uh, smooth edges, but a little more cartoony than the original, but highly detailed. One thing I'll notice here with these images is that, see these little swirls above the, so you've got these skull tiles, which are used to count damage for big monsters, which you're going to need a lot of, because a lot of these monsters have many body points. Every time they get hit, you're supposed to put a skull tile underneath the figure to show it's wounded. You're going to need a lot of those. But yeah, above the skull tiles, to the right of the crystal key there, you see these swirls. Originally, this was just a blue... In the original version, these this was like a blue tile with kind of an icy kind of surface texture, like frozen water. And then it just said the word magic ice, like just printed on top. Kind of generic. It's like, hey, it's magic ice, you know. <laughs> well, with this, t you know, they're making it a little, little uh, more artsy, so... I appreciate that change. You got this treasure room here. What that is supposed to be is, so the ice gremlins, they have the ability to steal 
uh, gear from heroes and run away in the same turn. And if they make it so that they're out of line of sight, they you just remove them from the board and that piece of gear is gone. Now they do clarify in the draft notes that what they wanted is that uh, the ice gremlins can steal anything that the hero has, except can't take the weapon out of his hand. So the one that he's using, he can't take the armor off of his back. So the body armor, but he could take a helmet, could take a shield, could take an artifact potion. They take one item and if they get away, it's gone. But the idea was this treasure room is, appears in various quests. And I had a question about it. And the designers clarified their notes, what their intention was originally, is that it's not just, like, let's say you've got a quest where you've got the treasure room. It's not just stuff that was stolen in that quest, but it would be stuff that was stolen at any time in the campaign up to that point. So Zargon should take note of what was stolen and make it discoverable in that room. So the heroes can go there, search for treasure, and find whatever it was. So, oh, they stole my dagger. Here it is. Or, oh, they stole, um, you know, the spell ring or something. Here, here's what it was. And Because there could be disputes about that. But the idea is, oh, taking their gear away is pretty, pretty severe uh, against the heroes. But they have the chance to get it back. So that's kind of cool. And there's multiple quests that have that treasure room. So... Maybe some more stuff gets stolen, but then they have another opportunity to get it back. And really, they need all the help they can get in these quests. So as, as, as cool as it is to have that, I think uh, it's nice that they clarified their intentions. Now, this, this icy crevice here is really dangerous because if a hero falls in there... So every time they step on one of these icy squares, they're supposed to roll... If they get a black shield, they take a, a point of damage, and it's like they're hanging on the edge. They're supposed to roll again, and if they get another black shield, they fell in the pit, and they're dead. Like, they can't escape. So that's pretty nasty. But what are the chances of you rolling two black shields twice in a row? Now, you might ask, well, is there any way they can get past that? Well, you can actually jump over the crevice, and if you have a potion that you bought, in Keller's Keeper, Return of the Witch Lord, which you can still buy in between quests. I mean, yeah, you're in the middle of this icy campaign, but technically between quests, you're allowed to buy potions with your gold that you found. So, oh, here I am at the alchemist shop again. Who knows why, but I get to buy a potion of dexterity. The potion of dexterity guarantees that you'll be able to jump the pit. Because think about it, normally, with the rules, if you try to jump a pit, you're supposed to roll one combat die, and if you get a skull, you fall in, so that's a 50% chance you're going to fall in, and your character's dead, and all his gear is gone. It's like, oh, wow, that's, that's some bad luck there. <laughs> you know, you're out of the campaign. Um, but, and yes, if a hero dies, his mercenaries can keep fighting for him, but in the next quest, you're supposed to substitute a, a totally different hero like a basic hero, so that's kind of tough. Um, but if you drink the Potion of Dexterity, it's a guaranteed jump, so you can just jump right over and get out of there, hopefully, uh, without any problem. There is, um, there is a spell in the Elf Quest pack, of course, it hasn't been remade yet, which lets you redo a turn, and just, 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 you get a total mulligan, you could just do it again. So if you had one of those <laughs> and you <laughs> fell in, of course, it's such a rare event. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, there's they basically introduce some really tough mechanics into this game. And I'm just thinking of ways that the heroes can get their way out of it. Because it's still supposedly a game for 10-year-olds. I mean, they say 14 and up, but that's just because pointy swords. You know, They have to pay extra money to, to test it for kids. All right, so that's that's that. Again, very little has changed here with uh, the remake versus the the original from '92. So this is just some cover art, and they've they've just blown this up. This is the artwork you'll see in some of those videos, like at PulseCon. They were well, we don't have much to say about HeroQuest, but you know you're gonna have to chill out while we, you know, just uh, think about it. So very similar artwork. 
there. Um, but uh, yeah, you can see the clear inspiration. Now that's the regular barbarian. That's the default barbarian with his. I guess he just uh, his clothes are blue now, but otherwise he's uh, not dressed for the weather. But the monster looks pretty cool. Looks pretty neat. Cool. <laughs> Get it. Uh, so very similar inspired artwork. So I'm not sure if Les Edwards did uh, the cover art for the original Frozen Horror or if it was a different artist. But clearly this is somebody else uh, with their own take on it. So again, you've probably seen this already, but I just wanted to acknowledge it and just give my little thoughts on it. So no problem there. And again, there's this pre-release box art that was featured on those websites. Acquires Hero Quest game system to play, sold separately, 14 plus. The Frozen Horror Quest Pack. I noticed they don't call it the Barbarian Quest Pack on here. And uh, who knows if that's final or not. Because yes, remember when they did the pledge campaign for the original remake um, for 2020? They showed a box art, they showed uh, character sheets, and that artwork changed from from that to the final version. So who knows? But yeah, no mention of Barbarian Quest back. Now it does prominently say Avalon Hill on there. This looks like a 3D mock-up. This doesn't look like an actual box to me. But yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some little tweaks to the text. But nice artwork. I know the main point of the stream is I want to talk about the the errata uh, and any new spin on it put by the the draft notes, but I'll, I'll get to that because I I really have special interest in it because I'm thinking if there's anything they can like any information that could be used to fix the new version would be great and if we can find that already in the original notes so much the better so there's the character sheet and i've mentioned this before so it's in blue ink now and final or not i mean it looks it looks kind of neat they've got icicles hanging off the battle axes and i see that there's uh, it's when it says quest completed circle there's one through ten and nine slash ten is treated as one quest so you can track your progress. So clearly they intended these extra character sheets to be used with this pack. So that's nice because, yeah, you can photocopy your your character sheets and the templates are online. It's easy to print them out. But that's, that's a nice, nice thing for the players because you've got this pad of character sheets. You know, to keep track of your body points and armor and weapons and potions and gold. And use pencil, kids. It's the best. So, yeah, pretty much uh, just another, again, the Frozen Horror, but no mention of Barbarian Quest Pack. Now, I think a lot of us are hoping that they will do the Dwarf and Wizard Quest Packs, and it'll be interesting to see, like, the fan uh, completion of those quests versus the official version, but there's been no official word on that yet. They haven't even acknowledged that they're probably going to do Mage of the Mirror. I mean, I'm just guessing because... They want to make as much money as possible. People are going to naturally ask, well, what's the next one? <laughs> and if they have, if they don't have one, a brand new one ready to go, they're going to dip into the legacy uh, stuff here and try to pick one that's, you know, apparently in demand. But again, just because it's offered on eBay and, you know, selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars doesn't mean that there's no problems with it obviously. All right, so I'm just going to hide that window now, and let's look at just a couple more pictures, and then we'll dive back into the draft notes, and I'll actually show you some some maps, and we can kind of follow along. Again, spoilerific spoilers to everybody, everybody watching, and thanks for joining us on HeroQuest Fans. If you haven't seen us before, we do appreciate, you know, the follow. Um, I was going to say like, subscribe, you know, comment. That's more of a YouTube thing, but hey, we like that too. I notice I'll post these videos on Twitch and get, you know, just a really small number of 
views or whatever, but then on uh, YouTube, like tons of pe tons more people will look at it. So I guess that's just kind of the nature of things. So there's okay. Again, this is probably close to the final version, if not the final version. But they could always change some stuff. So the Frozen Horror Quest Pack, Barbarian, prove your prowess and save the Northlands. I think the text is pretty similar to the original, if not identical. In this chilling expansion to the Hero Quest adventure, you must journey through the bleak and frigid Northlands to destroy the evil Frozen Horror. I think I call, referred to it as the Frozen Terror a couple of times because I thought that was the original name. It was actually called the Icy Horror. Like back when they were just sending out little flyers of there was just text, no pictures, telling people, hey, there's new quest packs coming. But yeah, the final name was the Frozen Horror. Barbarian quest pack, the Frozen Horror. A ferocious creature long banished. Banished? I thought it was destroyed. Okay. As the powerful barbarian, you are first challenged to survive dangerous solo quests to prove your strength and valor. Only then will your fellow heroes join you to gain access to Ice Mountain to destroy the scepter of glacial majesty and defeat the terrible monster. Contents. The quest, or quest book feature, uh, featuring 10 quests, 21 finely detailed miniatures, Frozen Horror Barbarian, 12 mercenaries, 3 ice gremlins, 2 polar war bears, 2 yetis, Two dungeon doors, 35 game cards, three cardboard tile sheets, six combat dice, two movement dice, and a pad of character sheets. Heck, a guy could have a pretty good time in Vegas uh, with all that stuff, right? Um, requires Hero Quest game system play, sold separately, and then it shows pictures once again. Here the dice look opaque. They don't look like casino dice that are transparent. And Sarah, you've got the distributions. No surprises there. Three of each of the four types of mercenaries. Yeah, the Frozen Horror looks gigantic. Now, it doesn't say, does it say actual size? No. Okay, the Frozen Horror has burst forth from the icy tomb where it rested these last centuries. And yes, they do call it an it in the original. They're not just trying to be gender neutral. Recovering its strength and awaiting Zargon's summons. At last, the call has come, and the raging beast has returned to its ancient seat of power, deep within Ice Mountain. As we speak, it is rallying its minions and mobilizing its plans to cover the Northlands in the realm in a shroud of deadly ice. So you start thinking about Mr. Freeze, you start thinking about uh, Batman and Robin movie, rest in peace, Joel Schumacher. Just kidding. Okay. I mean, I do hope uh, the best for his memory and everything. He made a bad movie. I think he even apologized. So, but yeah, it's kind of a laughing stock. <laughs> you got to love uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger as Mr. Freeze, just, just doing tons of like ice cold related puns. Anyway, that may come up in a gaming session with this, I could almost guarantee. All right, Barbarian, you must call on courage and skill you did not realize you had to confront the evil of the Frozen Horror. All right. Is there one more? Let me just check here. Yeah, this is just the same, same stuff. Okay, so enough of that. Let me just check the uh, chat. All right, we've got our one. Oh, <laughs> I missed. Uh, we've got some new people here. So welcome. Strange Bus, of course, the Strange Bus. Cool guy doing lots of streams, and he helps us out here. And he's also uh, newly joined the Discord channel, so he'll be helping us out there in between while he's doing all his retro and modern game streams. Welcome to uh, Lara Croft, Lara, Lara Croft and Sega Dream, along with Gassan PL. So welcome to HeroQuest fans. Thanks for joining us here on the live stream. And Striker667 stopped by to say good afternoon. Thank you for that, buddy. We do appreciate it. So yeah, we're live here on Twitch, but we also will be um, reposting this on YouTube. Oh, yeah, we got to get our image back here. So let me just restore our cameras. Yeah, a couple quick things. Um, <laughs> if we were popular, here's where we'd talk about our sponsors. But no, we're not going to do that. I can just see myself doing an Alfred Hitchcock Presents on that. Let me just rotate this a little bit. Oh. Yeah, 
I've got too many too many different images going here at once. Okay. So I just wanted to show you real quick. This I've talked about this stuff before. This and it doesn't have to be this brand, of course, but this is a, a glue stick. I use this a lot for repairs and for customs. So I've got chipboard and I'll make my own uh, tiles for these games. And this stuff, it starts out purple, but it dries clear. There's other versions that are just clear, just white, but it works pretty well. Now where it doesn't work so well is repairing a box, like where, where the edges are ripped. Like the, the corners of the boxes of these old games get, get ripped. I've actually been using um, Gorilla Glue. They've got wood glue. Um, that stuff works pretty well. Because I figure, you know, cardboard, it's wood pulp. Um, I've had some pretty good success with that stuff. Now, if you gloop it on, you really got to kind of clean it up a little bit. Because it's going to dry hard and it might not be transparent. It might be kind of white or gray. But yeah, anyway, but yeah, for just gluing uh, stuff that you print out to chipboard, cardboard for tiles works pretty well. This other stuff, I was talking about gold, gold paint. So I use like cheap, they call these just craft paints. So you can buy these at like Walmart or whatever, wherever. Um, this is a pretty, pretty decent gold, but it's not super, it's not like chrome or anything. I tried these, these gold paint pens. Uh, so there you got the Sharpie one. And there, and these are paint. These are like autograph pens, like if you're autographing something that's like black or whatever, or greeting cards. This, this Sharpie one is, is trash. I don't like it at all. It's, it's really oily and it doesn't stick very well. You can, it smears. I mean, it can rub off. This one's a little bit better, this uh, Bic, but it's still not very good. So I tried a couple of different things. Now, I've talked about this one before, this gold pen. Now, why am I talking this up? Well, I did have some miniatures that I was painting. It's got a kind of a, you got to shake it up. So 18 karat gold leaf, very expensive. It's like almost 10 bucks. Uh, Krylon, so they do a lot of the, you know, rattle cans, paint. You can never trust, you know, when you buy those uh, uh, spray paint cans, like the, the cap will be a certain color and they'll make it like gold chrome. It, like you can see your face in it. It's not really like that. So unfortunately, you know, you go to the paint aisle at one of these stores and you can see people have spray painted uh, in the store, like sprayed it to test. I mean, hopefully they're not huffing the paint fumes. That's bad for your brain there if you're uh, doing that intentionally. But yeah, uh, the fact is you can't really tell the color until you actually spray it on and see it dry. So this is this is better, I think, than these, these paint pens. Um, this is even better. And this stuff can be a little tacky after a while. So you put it on a surface and it looks great. It looks really shiny, really gold, um, much better than these others. I mean, these, these paint pens look dull in comparison, but it's still not quite the best that I've tested. And there's other channels, I think, um, oh, is it Squidmar? There was some other guy that talks about painting a lot, and he had this breakdown. He must have spent a lot of money on, on those different paints. But yeah, this one, this is, I've had the, the best success with gold for this premium Deco Color. Now, Deco Color, they, they do other craft paints. And as you can see, I had to tape this up because the cap is not very strong. It actually broke. So there's there's some problems with it, but this has the best. And this was actually the gold that I was using on those dice because I'm going to change the gold pips on the remake dice because they're just white. It's just kind of boring. I wanted them to be gold like the original game. So that's my little craft moment there talking about that. Uh, the other thing was I am reprinting the walls for Space Crusade. So these are what I mean by the walls. So these things are supposed to stand upright and you've got four of them and you can see there's little doorways and it it's a cool feature, but there are these plastic clips that clip it to the board 
And this is just a little bit too short. I don't know if it's because of age and warping or if they when they printed it out, they didn't think it through. But this thing needs to be like a half an inch longer on this end and maybe a quarter or half an inch longer on this side. So I'm, I've scanned them. I'm resizing the image, putting a little bit extra. I'm going to print it out and cut it out and glue it to chipboard and cut it out again, two-sided. And I'm going to have to use quite a bit of this to uh, get it done. So we'll see if it if it works out better than the original. Because I hate putting these up because they keep falling down and they get detached. They don't work that well. All right. So we, we did our craft stuff. Let's get back to talking about the Frozen Horror. So again, this is my um, uh, reprinted uh, custom copy. Now, I have made no changes to this. So if you go to HeroQuest by phoenix.yeoldin.com, you will find uh, Phoenix's page, and it's really awesome. He takes uh, quests from the past, and he'll modify them. So he took Wizards of Morkar, and he adapted it to the North American rules. He took, did the same thing with Against the Ogre Horde. He's taken like some of those quests that they published in White Dwarf Magazine, and Drago Brazil, this Portuguese thing, and he's put translations and it's really it's really nice and it's um, they're all PDFs and you scroll through and look at them but some of the things are changed so he made some editorial changes in those that were not in the original you know what he thought would be good fixes and some of some I agree with and some I don't some it's like well why did he do that and there's some errors too there's some mistakes like maybe he forgot a door he put the door in the wrong place you know it happens um, so I'm not faulting him for that um, fixes have been posted for those on yield in but yeah if you're if you're going by phoenix there might be a couple of things that are off so your best bet is to use the the official hasbro one assuming you don't have the original original the actual version but but this is i mean this is an exact representation this black and white scan of the uh original quest book so if it's in here you can pretty much bet it's going to be in not only the original physical copy but also more than likely it's going to be in the remake so there's there's the magic ice remember it just just text <laughs> um, but some details lost there so if we look at if we look at this here so this is my print job so we got the alchemist shop. So we're going to have these these potions. Now one interesting thing I thought with the draft notes that uh, Luca Pashi generously shared uh, scans that he'd made of. Um, you can see, so the potion of icy strength. Now we can pretty much bet in the remake it's going to be exactly like this. So they played around with the prices. I think originally it was 400 gold coins in the design documents. They changed it to 200, which is more reasonable. So after the Barbarian, so it's only a Barbarian potion, drinks this potion, his next attack causes twice as many body points of damage um, as are rolled on the combat dice. No other hero can use this potion. Okay. The original version is interesting because it says, yes, it gives him superhuman strength for one turn. It allows him to pick up and throw a monster. <laughs> So an adjacent monster, he picks that monster up and throws it, and it flies through the air until it hits a wall. And in that version of the Potion of Icy Strength, it doesn't damage the monster. Instead, it makes it so that that monster basically loses a turn. Although the way they worded it was kind of interesting. They said the monster can't attack or move on its next turn. So I guess it's stunned. Now it doesn't say it can't use magic. So I guess if it were like a magic wielding uh, bad guy, chaos magician, or in this version with the remake, dread magic, that's what they renamed it to avoid stepping on the toes of Games Workshop. Um, yeah, it wouldn't be able, it, it might be able to use a spell, but it couldn't use its attack. So I thought that was a, a cool thing, but they nixed it and decided, nah, it's just going to do damage like this. So yeah, and then just note this text here. Three of the above potions uh, can be used only by the Barbarian. Different potions may also be purchased from the Alchemist Shop and other quest packs. So yeah, if you want to see what the original original looks like in, in, in the flesh, so to speak, 
uh, just go ahead and ask uh, Dead Gamer on YouTube. Uh, shout out to him because he's got them. Uh, somehow he was lucky enough to get the Barbarian and Elf quest books. He, he, mu he must have the whole set because why would you stop there? But I'm sure it cost him a pretty penny. Or maybe he had it from back in the day. Who knows? Because some people hung on to their stuff all those years. So, but anyway, this is just a reproduction, but it should be the same. So there you got the assembly of your miniatures. And in the remake, they're going to come pre-assembled. So there you see the Yeti looks more like Cookie Monster. <laughs> with, uh, I guess in this picture, he doesn't look that much that Cookie Monster-esque you know, from Sesame Street. But yeah, the Polar War Bears and the Frozen Horror. So they talk about the new monsters. And there's the original distributions. And they give you lots more skull tiles because they know that you're going to be fighting monsters with a lot more damage. Now let me just show you. So this is the, again, this is the original. So the Frozen Horror, notice how his uh, map symbol is elongated like that. That's because he takes up two squares. So even in the remake thus far, they haven't done the two square monsters yet. The dragon is huge, you know, from Joe Manginello's quest uh, book. Crypt of Perpetual Darkness, which only Mythic Pledgers got. Even that one only takes up one square. So you got, uh, yeah, he's the final boss. He has eight movement squares, five attack dice, four defend dice, six body points, and four mind points. So he's a nasty character. And check this out. The Frozen Horror can cast the following chaos spells. Chill, that's like basically automatic damage. Ice Storm, it affects a bunch of squares. Ice Wall, Mind Freeze, Skate. Skate is like Veil of Mist for monsters. He can pass by heroes. And Soothe, which is like healing. Zargon could choose an additional six Chaos Spells for the Frozen Horror from any of the Chaos Spells in the game system. Now, for reference, there were 12 Chaos Spells in the game system for the North American version. Chaos Spells didn't exist in the original uh, version of the game in Europe although they did introduce them in later quest packs. So, but yeah, so he's quite powerful. So he's got 12 spells overall, with the exception of the escape spell. So he can't use that one. Now, in the original version, they were some controversy, like what other spells is he going to use? So they were saying, well, we already told people that if they want, if you can buy uh, potions from other quest packs that you own in between quests, not just these four, so if you've got Keller's Keep, Return of the Witch Lord, you can buy those potions as well. And there's no limit on how many you can buy. It doesn't matter if you run out of cards. You can just keep buying them. I think the only limitation they put was Potion of Dexterity. You can only use one per turn. But it's not like the European version where, you know, you find a potion and you got to, if you didn't use it, you lose it in between quests. So Potion Hoarder Edition. But yeah, they were saying, well, what if you own one of these other packs where there's new spells? Um, does the Frozen Horror get some of those? They're like, no, no, no. We're only talking about the Chaos Spells from the game system as the additional six. Still, it's pretty powerful. Okay, and then we've got the Ice Gremlin. Ten movement squares, so just like a, go a goblin. Two attack dice only. Three defend dice. Three body points, which is a lot for a monster. And three mind points. So during Zargon's turn, each Ice Gremlin can either attack a hero or mercenary, or it can steal one item from one hero's Zargon's choice. Presumably they have to be adjacent. Okay. The item stolen cannot be the armor or shield a hero is using. Okay, so they did change that. I think originally they could just grab the shield away. Um, and armor, does that include helmets? nor the weapon he is wielding. As soon as an ice gremlin has stolen an item, it runs away at full speed. The heroes can chase the ice gremlin on their turn. If they catch it and destroy it, they regain the stolen item. If no hero can see the ice gremlin at the start of Zargon's turn, the ice gremlin has escaped with the item. The item should be crossed off the hero's character sheet, remove the ice gremlin from the game board. So with the caveat that whether it's explained adequately in here or not, they did intend those treasure rooms would be an opportunity for you to reclaim the lost gear. They don't say here that a mercenary seeing an ice gremlin means he's still within sight. So maybe they could add that in there. 
I mean, I would have assumed. I mean, if I were Zargon, yeah, I, I recognize that these quests are super hard. I would have thrown him a bone and said, sure, sure. The mercenary can see him. Maybe he's still on the board then. Now we got the Polar War Bear. Six movement squares. Four by four attack. And I'll explain in a minute what that is. That basically means he can attack multiple times. Wow. Yeah. Three defend dice. Six body points. Two mind points. Very powerful monster. The Polar War Bear attacks once with its mighty paw and once with its spiked mace. Of course, you wonder why did it need the mace at all. Two attacks can be made against one opponent, or one attack can be made against each of two different opponents. Here is a controversial part. So I'll read what the official text says in this final version, but it seems what they ended up deciding is that instead of... So in the original game, it's not quite clear. But you assume that every time an attack is made, the target always gets to roll defend dice, right? Always. Unless they're a victim of the sleep spell, in which case they don't get to defend. Or they fell in a trap, like a falling block trap. They just roll the attack dice and that's it. There's no defense against it. But in most cases, you just assume they can defend. So there's two ways that heroes can make two attacks against a monster. If you have uh, an artifact called Orc's Bane, which is a magical short sword, that artifact or quest treasure, it was called in the original, that allows you to make two attacks against orcs. So you could attack one orc twice, or you could attack two different orcs. They don't explain that apparently what they were thinking is for every turn, you can only defend against one attack from each miniature. So let's say a hero gets attacked by, he's flanked by three zombies. Each zombie attacks the hero. The hero rolls defense dice each time. But if the one monster had two attacks, the hero only gets one roll of defense. And what the designers were saying originally in the notes was, yeah, this is a rule of clarification. So we're saying that each hero only gets one defensive roll for each monster that attacks him. And the same is true for monsters. So they're reinterpreting the original rules, which would say, okay, so if you've got Orcs Bane and you've got one Orc in your sights and you attack him twice, it's since it's two dice, it's like you're really attacking him with four dice. And he's defending with two dice, but he only gets one defense. I would have always assumed, yeah, it's just another chance. You know, he defends once, he defends again. The other way the heroes could do two attacks against a monster was with a potion called Heroic Brew, which you find in the treasure deck. But in theory, I mean, you could find it in one quest, and maybe in the next quest you find it again, and so you've got two, you, you could stockpile them, and you could drink them all on your turn. So does that mean you get, like, six attacks? I mean, maybe. <laughs> you know, I guess it's up to Zargon to decide. If that's allowed, if potions stack, I be, would be okay with that. But some GMs would, would balk at it. But the idea there is, okay, well, the monster is rolling defense every single time, right? Well, maybe not, according to these designers. So uh, a year after the original game system are saying, no, the monster would get one dice roll. But it is an important clarification of what they were thinking by looking at these draft notes, because you could have imagined that, okay, the Polar War Bear does one attack. Let's say he gets no skulls. Okay, the hero defends. Well, he didn't need to defend, so he's fine. But guess what? The second attack comes, and it's unblockable. Maybe the hero would have rolled, like, four white shields. Uh, it doesn't help him now, so he gets kind of screwed over. So it's like the, the second attack is like a free attack. That's one way to interpret it. Another way would be to say, well, he does the two attacks. You really think of it as one attack. So it's like an eight dice attack. And the hero gets to defend once. And whatever defense he gets goes to, towards that. So he could get eight skulls. And the hero rolled full, four white shields. So he blocks four of them. But then the other four hit him. So he loses four body points of damage. And that might kill him unless he's got, you know, a potion 
or an unused healing spell or spell scroll that would save his life. Because in the original version of the game, you couldn't do that, that last minute save. The North American version, you can explicitly. So I think they could have put worded it a little better in here saying that, yes, what we're really saying is each figure can defend once against each attack from another figure. So it doesn't matter if a monster attacks you six times in a row on the same turn, you get one defensive roll. But that defensive roll applies to all those attacks. So it's really like they're making one big attack rather than repeating the same attack over and over. So long-winded explanation. But a little bit of clarification there would help because I think there's one way to read it which is very hard. And there's another way which is still pretty challenging, still pretty tough, but a little more fair. Because, yeah, the heroes get to do these multiple attacks against monsters a lot more often than the monsters get to do the attack against the heroes. All right. And here is the, the really controversial one that a lot of people have, have recognized. So the Yeti. Eight movements, and just like an orc. Three attack dice. Three defend dice. So not, not a slouch. I mean, he's basically like a Fimmer. Fimmers or Abominations in the remake have three attack and three defense, but he moves like an orc. And he's got five body points, so stronger than a Chaos Warrior or Gargoyle, because they only have four. So no slouch there. And he's got two mind points, which is pretty low. So you could use a sleep spell on him. Of course, the Barbarian doesn't have a sleep spell, because he's not the wizard or elf. Okay, whenever the Yeti's attack causes a hero to lose at least one body point, the Yeti grabs the hero in a powerful hug. This hug inflicts two body points of damage to the hero at the start of each subsequent Zargon turn. Wow. The hero cannot defend against this attack, nor can he take any actions. The Yeti can make no other attacks while hugging. This continues until either the hero dies or the Yeti is killed by the hero's companions. Okay. <laughs> See, I was so shocked by that, I had to drop it. Okay. Spoilerific spoilers. So if we're looking at the quest book, and the thing is, Zargon can always change these quests up when he's playing. I mean, he's supposed to do that anyway if they have to repeat. So let's look at the solo quest. Cheers, Dead Gamer. Yep. I think uh, I need a better beverage here. Yeah, yeah. So sorry I missed the, um, the note there from Striker667. So that's how I've been handling two attacks. One defensive roll. Well... You're ahead of the game, Striker, because we always took it as every attack gets a defense. It doesn't explicitly clarify in those cases with Orc Spain and Heroic Brew. But the monsters hardly ever get a chance to do the same back to the heroes. So then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. So welcome to Striker667, welcome to 0AX2. So if you came in late, we're talking about the Barbarian Quest Pack, the Frozen Horror. And the reason we're going over this again is we're looking at the original game to see what to expect in the remake. Because chances are, I mean, based on their previous track record, they're not going to change a darn thing about this, right? And that could be for the worse, because there are some problems in this uh in this quest book. But we're also talking about it because Luca Passi who is spearheading the group that's going to try to finish the unreleased, unfinished uh, wizard and dwarf quest packs, which were planned to be released in 92 or 93, which but never came out. Um, you know, there's just this whole big stash of, of designer notes that he was able to acquire uh, legally, and uh, fans are going to try to finish that. And who knows what Hasbro will do. Um, it would be cool if they kind of work together with fans and uh, release those someday. But for now, we're talking about the Barbarian uh, quest pack and maybe how those designer notes can like give us some insight and how they could fix it, you know, where they went wrong with some of the things. And uh, so I am looking at the, this is a reproduction of the quest book. So welcome once again, everybody to HeroQuest fans. And Dead Gamer has got the original, I think. So hit him up on YouTube. But yeah, in this, I'm just looking at some spoilers here for these quests. So if you go to uh, 
your favorite search engine and search for Frozen Horror Quest book, you'll find an official uh, copy that you can look at for free from uh, from Hasbro, from Milton Bradley. But yeah, so there's going to be some spoilers here. So let's, uh, oh, let's first let's read this text here to show you where one of the problems is. Okay, the quests, playing the Barbarian Quest Packs, pack. These 10 new quests are generally played the same way as the quests in the game system. As in the game system, heroes are returned to full strength between quests, thank goodness. All body and mind points are restored. All right, let's, we can get rid of that other window. We're done talking about craft stuff for now. All right, the quests. The first three quests are solo adventures designed for play by a barbarian alone. These can be used as an introduction to hero quest for a new player. That's a big problem because these are some of the hardest quests you're gonna play. And there's definitely some glitches as we've mentioned. Again, I'm not trying to be repetitive with this, but just wanna point that out. If anybody from Hasbro or Avalon Hill is listening or as fun quests to play when only two players are available. Okay, so that part right there. Now again, I'm not trying to be a rules lawyer here, but there's most people who buy this game are gonna play it according to what it says in this official text, right? They're not gonna just go, you know what, that's crappy, I'm gonna homebrew it. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but people are gonna try to play it as written first, right? So they should make that as clear and as fair, balanced, whatever as possible. So that could use some work. So if they're gonna be doing it with brand new players, they need to make it easier. Otherwise, it's just gonna destroy those players and they're not gonna to wanna to come back and play HeroQuest again. I mean, think about all those players that played the trial and were just absolutely wiped out, total party kill. And when you're nine years old, 10 years old, that's kind of hard to take, right? Yeah, you gotta teach kids sportsmanship and everything, but. Eh, let's play a different game. <laughs> so um, that might turn people away from HeroQuest. Uh, and, and there's some glitches where I don't think they intended it to really be that hard. With the two-player option, okay, yeah, you don't have enough people to do all four. I mean, it's always been true that one person could control four heroes, but the game takes a lot longer because you're thinking about it and you got to manage a lot more resources as that player, because you got the wizard and all his spells and the elf and his spells, and you got the barbarian and the dwarf. Um, plus you're like, oh, it's like I've got four lives. So maybe you throw away one hero so that you can keep going. Whereas four players, you know, you're gonna have your action ready to go most of the time. <laughs> when it, your turn comes around, you're ready to go. And so the game can move along and the players work out amongst themselves how they work together. So there's a different, totally different dynamic, but yeah, two players, the Barbarian could be a seasoned player. He could have some extra armor and potions that he saved from previous quests. He might be completely tricked out, you know, with plate mail and shield and helmet and uh, crossbow and longsword and whatever. He might already have that stuff, so it might not be as tough. But even then, it is broken because that Yeti, that Yeti attack can wipe out a hero because you'll notice not to get back into the Arata stuff, but if if he encounters that Yeti, there's no way he can be saved. Because if he gets caught in the hug, he just can't get out of it. Because somebody else has to kill the Yeti to free him, and there's nobody else to free him. He can't hire mercenaries, there's no other players. So he's just, he's just done. As soon as that Yeti does any damage, he's done. The game is basically over. And he can't memorize where the Yeti is in the quest, because Zargon's supposed to rearrange the map every time. So that's going to lead to an argument between the two players, like, get rid of that monster, he's broken, right? So anyway, that's a problem. Now, later in the game, when you meet the Yeti again, and you've got other heroes, okay, you can save the trapped hero. Okay. Also, if a new Barbarian is to join a party of experienced characters, these three quests will enable the Barbarian to catch up with the other heroes by gaining gold, equipment, and magical items. Okay, that's a, that's a worthy idea. I like it. But again, if uh, he just keeps dying over and over, like 90% chance of failure, it's not going to be much fun. He's not going to want to play with the other players. He's just going to give up. Because you're trying to ease a new player into the game. I think a lot of tabletop gamers have 
been through that, where you're trying to encourage somebody, you know, give them a couple of wins, you know, show them how much fun the game can be so that they join when they join the group, they know what's going on. Because it can be tough, you know, there's a little bit of a learning curve if you don't play a lot of these type of games. And they talk about the female barbarian, we've already talked about that. And then mind points. Starting and ending a quest, heroes do not always start and end their quests on the spiral stairway. So, yeah, you've got the entrance and exit doors. The thing is, you can uh, you can escape the quest early by going back through the door down the stairs before you've accomplished your mission. But again, Zargon is supposed to rearrange the quest if you replay it, right? Or if you fail. So it's not like you can just memorize it. That'd be pretty cheap anyway. <laughs> uh, ban those smartphones at the door. Okay. Yeah, so here we go. Real Rule clarifications. So passing items, we already knew about that pretty much. Um, spiral staircase. Yeah, if a hero stands on the spiral stairway and attacks monsters, the monsters can attack back on Zargon's turn. Well, yeah. What you're supposed to do is, as soon as you touch the st spiral staircase, you exit the quest. But if you're going to stand there and fight monsters, well, the monsters get to fight you. It's not like you're in a safe space. Multiple attacks. A hero rolls defend dice once for each attacking monster. For example, a hero attacked by three zombies gets three separate defend rolls. A hero attacked by a monster with multiple attacks, such as the polar war bear, however, gets only one defend against that monster per turn. A little bit of clarification would be nice. No matter how many of the monster's attacks are directed at the hero. So I think that's workable if they just clarify that it's basically, basically like he's got one big roll and the hero has one big defensive role. I don't think there's any potions that allow the hero to defend twice, but there are potions and spells that allow the hero to roll more than he normally would. Note, if you run out of monsters called for, substitute other monsters of similar strength. Yep. Now these... Um, I talked about this in a previous stream, so again, not trying to repeat myself here, but there are some traps that are on the other side of doors. So one rule of clarification they talked about but was not featured in here is that heroes ought to be able to do a blind trap jump. So if they're playing along and they suspect there might be a trap on the other side of a door, they're going to say, jump in the trap. Roll one combat die. If it's a skull, you get hit what, by whatever's there, unless there wasn't a trap. And, and uh, if you roll anything else, you're okay. Just get a little drink here. Cheers once again to Dead Gamer and all the other Dead Gamers out there. So yeah, the stalactite trap causes one body point of damage. There's no defense against that. So it's, it's worse than a spear trap. Now, uh, in the designer notes, they were saying, well, how do you disarm a trap that's on the ceiling? Well, who knows, right? You could reason, well, maybe it's not just a stalactite that just falls from the ceiling just randomly, but maybe there's a trigger, just like a spear trap or a falling block trap. There's a trigger you step on that causes it to release. And so by disarming it with your toolkit, or if you're the dwarf, or in this quest pack, uh, you can hire a mercenary scout he could disarm it, so he just does whatever. So these are the mercenaries. Scout, 50 gold coins is the cheapest one. Nine movement squares, two attack, three defend. Two body points, two mind points. So Scout has the dwarf's ability to detect and disarm traps. So he's actually better. I mean, a toolkit will cost you 250 gold, but this guy for one quest will cost you 50. Oh yeah, and I talked about how yeah, they debated about this. In the original version of the notes, they said mercenaries do collect treasure, and whatever treasure they find, they keep. So then you think, well, why would you ever want the mercenary to search for treasure? I mean, he's going to get hit by the hazard or wandering monster, and if it's something good, he's going to just keep it. It could be a way to give mercenaries potions, but they don't clarify. Like, can one of the heroes pass a potion to a mercenary so he could drink it and, like, heal himself? Like, let's say if he's down to one body point doesn't say you would assume right but in this one it says they do not collect any treasure mercenaries can only move attack and defend except for scouts who can detect and disarm traps the cost 
uh, to hire them for one, is for one quest only. If a player wants to hire a mercenary for more than one quest, he must pay the mercenary's cost for each quest. My, my suggestion, which was not mentioned in the notes that I've found, I mean, I'm almost all the way through all the drafts. There's like four different draft versions with tons of notes, hundreds of pages overall. Uh, they don't mention a discount, but in Wizards of Morkar, which is the original place that these mercenaries are mentioned, there was a discount. So if he survives the quest and you want to rehire him or uh, retain him for the next quest, his retainer fee is only 10 gold coins, which is great. You know, you pay 75 up front or 50 or whatever. And then to keep him, you only pay 10. But in this one, you just pay the same amount. So it's almost like they're encouraging players to just say, yeah, use these guys as cannon fodder, throw them away. Because it's the same cost whether they live or die anyway. So I think the discount could be a nice... Uh, homebrew rule if not a, an official fix because it has precedent in the series yeah the halberdier so they went back from pikeman to halberdier uh 75 gold six movement three attack three defend and he can attack diagonally two body points now you notice these are basically treated like monsters so they got predefined movement you can't give them a weapon or armor and if they die, it's not like you can recover their gear and use it yourself. So just like monsters have predefined weapons, it's not like you kill an orc and you get his sword. I mean, that would be a homebrew rule. Um, they just have a predefined attack. So yeah, that's the mercenaries. So back to this. Um, yeah, so I was talking about something else before that. Sorry. So the idea was in the designer notes, but not in here, they were saying you could do a blind trap jump. So if you suspect uh, whether or not you've searched for traps or not, because if it's in another room that you haven't entered yet, you can't search for traps in that room on the other side of the door. But you could say, OK, I'm going to jump that square. I'm going to jump the square. So you're telling Zargon, you roll the one combat die. If it's a skull, you land on the square. If it's anything else, you jumped over the square. So you got to have enough movement to go over. That way you could avoid these otherwise unavoidable traps that are on the other side of the door. I think that's a great idea, and I wish they'd put it in here. That would have been a nice clarification, because all the other quests, going back to the game system, they would have these instances where you've got a trap on the other side of the door, there's nothing you can do about it. And if it's a stalactite trap, there's no chance to avoid it, there's no chance to defend. It's it's a really cheap way to take damage. And I guess it's the same if there's like a pit trap. Now, once the pit trap is revealed, yeah, it's a permanent hazard, but at least people can try to jump over it. And yeah, you can find the rabbit boots, which mean you um, roll anything but a black shield, so it's much easier. But there's only one instance of rabbit boots, so that's just one hero. And yeah, you can buy the uh, potion of dexterity, but that costs you gold. And what if there's two traps? You only get one guaranteed pit jump, and you can only drink one of those potions. So there's instances here where they put like two traps on the other side of the door so it's like oh i jumped over that one and then i fell right into the next one i guess that problem is happens no matter what but i think that clarifying rule would have been nice i wish the designers had put it in the final version i guess they were short on time or whatever okay selling excess items we we pretty much assumed you could always do this but you sell it back at half price to the armory even though in the remake there's no actual armory it's just a deck of cards but the idea is you, you sell some of your excess gear back half price, use that gold. Now, it'll be interesting to see in the remake what they say about potions because, okay, I can understand, yeah, you know, you get your sword. It's not like you take the sword out of the shrink wrap, now it's worth less. You assume that, okay, you it gets some wear and tear, but why would a potion be only half price if you didn't use it? Because you either use it or you don't. Is it because... Do, do they expire? Do they lose their potency over time? Who knows? But it'll be interesting to see how they answer that. But presumably, it'll be the same. So if you didn't use that holy water, I guess it's only worth 300 gold now. Treasure. To eliminate conflicts among the heroes, large gold coin treasures found in treasure chest should be divided among all surviving heroes. Now, this is different. In the original notes, they were talking about... Originally, they said all gold. So your Zargon is supposed to keep track of all the gold they find in a quest, divide it up ev ev equal shares for, for all the heroes that are surviving. 
But then they were saying, well, no, it should only be for the gold rewards, because certain quests you get a reward for completing the quest, but any gold that you find during the quest, like from treasure deck or whatever, that should be kept by that individual hero. But they just decided large gold coin treasures. So that's totally up to Zargon. What does that constitute? Large. Found in treasure chests should be divided among all surviving heroes. But, I mean, it's always been the case that it's always up to Zargon how they do that. Because here, I like that they say this. and I mean, Shadzar would appreciate this, and I do too. Zargon, study this book carefully. Although it is your guide to running these adventures. Guide. Okay? And so it's not like a Bible. It's, it's a guide to running these adventures. It may not answer every question you have during play. When in doubt... Use your experience and imagination to make the best choice. Remember, you are the ultimate authority in your HeroQuest world. So I think that's a, an important bit because it, it is a game. It is for fun. But Zargon, the GM, makes the call. So if something's vague or you know, it's not working, here you go. You come up with a weird situation. He or she makes the call. Executive decision. All right, and then they talk about mercenaries. Six mercenaries with 12 interchangeable weapons, so that explains why they made 12 in the new remake of Frozen Horror. Four types. In some quests, mercenaries serve as evil monsters who oppose the heroes whenever mercenaries shown on the quest map. It should be considered a monster controlled by Zargon. Mercenaries are also soldiers who can hire, be hired by a hero before a quest begins. They will accompany any hero on a quest if the hero pays their fee fee for each type of mercenary, blah, blah, blah. Gold must be paid before the quest begins. Mercenaries may be hired for any group quest, group quest in this quest pack, but not for solo quests. So now they could make it so that they could change this and just say you can hire them in the solo quests. I mean, he's not, the hero's probably not going to have any gold in the very first quest if, you know, you're playing it, you know, as a new, brand new character. But another way to get around this, you know, is to say, yeah, yeah, this is still the rule, but, well, maybe there's a um, an evil crossbowman who converts to your side, and now you've got a mercenary just for that quest to help you out. Or maybe you find a prisoner, and you free him, and he, oh, his weapons are laying right there outside his cell, and he can become a mercenary for free, essentially. So there's ways you could do it. To give him some help. That's just one possible way you can make the game a little bit more forgiving. Mercenaries controlled by the hero who hired him. Oh, another issue. This is just my homebrew thing. So I've shown on this stream before, this channel, where I made these little tokens for the heroes to keep track of which mercenaries belong to which hero. Which you could do with just, just taking any token or whatever put it underneath the figure to show which is which because they're all the same color and it'd be kind of hard to figure it out otherwise keep track sorry it's a little dry in here let me just check the stream make sure there's no issues hope everybody's having a good day here hero quest fans and uh yeah strange bus is with us we've got some of our regulars and some new people. Welcome. Talking about the Frozen Horror, talking about the Barbarian Quest Pack, even though we're having some nice warm weather. A lot of people are thinking this will be released in late September. But we don't have official word from Avalon Hill about that. And they haven't officially said it's going to be a retail release either, but everybody's kind of assuming, hoping that they learned their lesson, you know, after the Guardian Knights debacle. That it needs to be a retail release. It needs to be limited, not limited, <laughs> not a limited time exclusive from certain retailers or whatever. And I, I've said it before, and I'm going to hold myself to the standard. So if I reverse myself, you can call me a hypocrite. You can call me whatever. <clears throat> but my, um, what I, I'm saying right now is, if they make this a limited time exclusive, I'm not going to buy it. I'm just going to wait until it's a retail release. And no, I'm not going to go on eBay and get a scalped version. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I can't afford the original, and I won't be able to afford a scalped version either. And I don't like to support that kind of stuff. 
you know, I, I feel like I, I got sucked in by the pledge drive and I got sucked in by the guardian Knights, and I'm not going to do it again. I'm done, done with that. So uh, I think a lot of other people had more restraint. They didn't have that fear of missing out and they waited for the retail release for the game system. Good for them. And I'm going to do this with the barbarian quest pack because yeah, I'm curious. And just like with dead gamer, I mean, he sh shared before I had my copy, he shared what the content of these quest books was, which is was a great help, and I can't thank him enough for that. I'm sure other people who get it will be able to share what's in it, because I'm really curious what changes, if any, they make to this, which I hope they make some good changes, but they may not. So I'll just have to rely on that rather than being the first kid on the block to get it and, and all that sort of thing. So even though I want to be a journalistic reporter for this and take the hit i this time i'm just not going to do it so if it's only 50 dollars as they're speculating it's not too bad but i can just imagine scalpers selling it for a lot more so i'm just not going to do that so anyway here's the spoilers we're finally going to talk about the spoilers so notice there are some traps that cannot be detected even by searching so light green originally they were going to say blue but there's quite a few of them so here's the spoilers so this is quest one the Xanon Pass, solo quest, so no mercenaries. All right, so you start here with the door. You go in, and uh, yeah, you could go one way. But it's pretty much a dead end. It's very linear. So just as written, more than likely, you're going to go over. Let's see. Yeah, these wandering monster traps, you can't detect them, you can't jump over them, you're just going to get hit by them. In the designer notes, originally they didn't have these wandering monster traps, they were introduced kind of late in the game. And so they pretty much added to every quest, they added two of them. And then the final quest, as I forgot to mention, it's a two-parter. So quest 9 and 10, you actually cross over. So see how there's that exit door? So yeah... All the heroes have to go at the same time. You can't just have one guy like playing on another board. You're supposed to clear the board and redo it. It's super hard because you don't get to heal in between these last two quests. But that's with all four heroes. But yeah, they added four wandering monster traps. So there's two of them here and then nine and ten and then there's two more. So there's like four. So those are really hard. And you can see that the wandering monsters, a lot of times it's... Uh, like three ice gremlins appear at once. So you could get that from landing on that square or just getting, you know, those six treasure cards. Two Yeti. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so the Yeti is, you encounter him pretty, pretty soon. So you go through here. So two skeletons. You go through here, boom, boom. So you encounter him. You could theoretically... Okay, you're going to fight a couple of skeletons. You go through here, boom, and there he is. There's the Yeti. So you're going to encounter him very early on. And I don't think there's any choice because it's not like you can skip that room. I mean, I guess you could skip these rooms entirely. You could go around and just go down in here. Now, this, uh, this crossbowman... Originally, they were just saying, yeah, he gives, he shoots at you until you try to attack him, and then he gives you his crossbow in exchange for his life and runs away. Originally, they didn't say that, so it's like, oh, do you just, you just kill him and take his crossbow? You just knock him out and take his crossbow? <laughs> in the designer notes, they were saying, yeah, he runs away, slipping as he goes, because it's there's all this slippery ice that can't be detected. Well, easy fix for this. Why not just say, instead of just giving you the crossbow. He just joins your cause. So now you've got a mercenary. So you could go... Or no, you could go this way. And you could... See, again, I could play this whole thing out. But I, I just want to do it this way to show you. So he could go this way. And... Oh, it's a dead end. He's going to come back, go around this way, and instead of going through this way and encountering the Yeti, he goes south. 
he finds the crossbowman. See, now he could just continue on. Go to the end. Now that's going to be really tough. And then come back and then go to the end. Yeah, so it's kind of just dumb luck. But most heroes, as soon as they see a door, they're going to go exploring. And you're going to encounter that. But you could, just by sheer chance, skip this. And let's say you go all, you take the long way around. Is that right? Take the long way around, you skip this completely. And you go, because as soon as you cross over, you're going to see these doors. That's pretty tempting for most people. So you go down here, you get the, and let's say this guy joins you. Now all of a sudden you're going to have a crossbow guy. And instead of continuing on, you decide, I'm going to go backtrack here. The Yeti grabs you. The crossbow guy could shoot the Yeti and kill it and get him off of you. Because in, according to these rules, the Yeti can't defend. So he could kill the Yeti and save you. So that's kind of cool. But that's only if they allow him to join your cause. If not, it doesn't matter how well equipped that barbarian is. He could have all the potions in the world. If he takes any damage from that Yeti, he's screwed. It's it's over. Now you could just get rid of that monster entirely. Put a different monster there. Make it a lot easier. But in the original designer notes, what they said was the Yeti grabs you in the hold. And instead of doing two body points damage per, per turn, it's just one. Okay. And they said each turn, the Barbarian gets to roll two white combat dice. And if he rolls one white shield, he doesn't take the damage that turn. If he rolls two white shields, he escapes the hold. I think that's great. I wish they would have gone with that. That was like the first version that I saw in the drafts. Uh, a later version, they said, well, he just gets to roll his normal defend dice. They don't say anything about breaking the hold. So I guess it does two damage in the second version. And it, let's say he has like four defend dice or whatever, or just two. Um, he rolls defend dice. He blocks all the damage, but he's still trapped in the hold. So it's like, it's just a stalemate. The game's never going to end until he gets a bad roll and he's just dead. But he can never escape. Because there has to be somebody else to protect or to, to save him. Oh, yeah, in the original notes, they said, well, the the Yeti who's in the hold can't do any actions, but he can still defend, but the, he defends with one less. So let's look at that. So the Yeti would defend with uh, two. So still pretty powerful, but it, again, it doesn't matter because there's nobody to save the Barbarian's Bacon in this case. So that's still a problem. And then they evolved into the final version we see, which is there's no chance for uh, either the Barbarian or whoever's caught in the hole. There's no chance for them to defend. There's no chance for the, the Yeti to defend. Now then there's another question is, well, what if there's two Yeti and they both grab the same hero? Is that possible? Because he could do an attack, and since the Barbarian can't defend, he could get grabbed by two of them. So now you got to kill two of them to get him off of him. What if there's three? What if there's four? <laughs> so it, it can get kind of absurd. So I think they just need to do another pass. And if they went back to the old version, that would be so much better. Different people have come up with different fan solutions. Like one person said, well, what if you had a dagger? Maybe the dagger can let you be free. Or my solution was, you know, you, in between quests, you know, you learn a wrestling trick from a guy in town. You just roll uh, movement dice. And if your movement dice are higher than what the Yeti rolls, you just break out of it. But I think the original solution was pretty elegant. So more spoilers. Otherwise, there's not a lot of problems with this quest. Um, they do the, the uh, trap in front of the door thing, but it's only a spear trap. So you roll a one combat die, and if it's a skull, it hits you. So there's a 50% chance it won't even hit you. And if it doesn't, you can just keep on moving. But if you had the roll to, you know, blind trap jumping roll option, you could you could get through it. Actually, you'd be coming this way, so never mind. No, it, it's on the other side of the door. So you you just you do, you search for after you kill the monster, you search for traps, disarm it, or try to jump it, and then just continue on your merry way. 
and thankfully they they marked all the treasure chests and they didn't they didn't say that they were empty that's annoying okay so let's look at quest two again this is a reproduction but this is the original so this is not phoenix's version so no editorial changes have been made so trial by ice again a solo quest so let's see do we have any yeti yes we do so we've got another yeti and you're going to come in through here blah 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 obviously spoilers all around and uh, the armband of ice would have been a really nice uh artifact to find but it's not mentioned anywhere as one that you find, even though they give you a card. So it's just for your homebrew adventures. My thought would be after you complete quest three, give them the armband of ice as a reward. I think that'd be really cool. That, that protects you from a lot of these ice based attacks, traps and spells, but only one hero gets to wear it. So it's not like it protects everybody, just that hero. And if he dies and loses it, then it's gone. Now they say that if uh, an artifact is, you know, it's lost to monsters, which is what happens if a hero dies and there isn't another hero in the room or corridor to claim it or mercenary to claim it. Um, Zargon's supposed to make it a special treasure in the next quest, early in the next quest. So somebody else could find it again. So it's not completely gone. If it gets stolen, well, it goes into that treasure room. Oh yeah, what's that treasure room look like? just for fun, because they explain all the symbols and they tell you, yeah, go ahead and photocopy these to your heart's content to make your own quests. Let's see, there's the crevice, frozen crypt. Oh yeah, this was called the Room of Mirrors originally. Frozen crypt room. Yeah, this changed uh, quite a bit. It was like the Room of Mirrors and there was some other name they gave it and I forgot already. I'm going to have to go back through the notes. But yeah, there's the Ice Gremlin treasure room. Their booty is all stored in this room. Ha ha ha. Okay. Some other stuff. Living fog. Okay, so we've got uh, Trial by Ice, Solo Quest 2. Let's check in the chat again here. It's the Fritz. Welcome. So we got uh, another returning visitor. Thank you for joining us here on Hero Quest fans. We're talking about the Barbarian Quest Pack, Quest Book, Frozen Horror, full of spoilers. So this is the this is a, a reproduction of the original. So this is going to be accurate to the original text and everything. You can find this on Hasbro's um, customer care page. Just use your favorite search engine, search for Frozen Hero, Fro uh, sorry, Frozen Horror Quest Book. And you'll find a PDF, and it's in black and white, but this is pretty much it. So even though Phoenix has a really great reproduction of this, Phoenix Phoenix has made a couple editorial changes, and there's a couple of mistakes in there too that weren't in the original. So Trial by Ice, obviously spoilers everywhere. I hate that treasure chest is empty. Now, um, at this point, you know these quests are so hard. I would say what they probably should do is just just scratch that out and put potion of healing, four body points or one d6. I think that would make it a lot better. Cause yeah, by this time he could have some gear. The solo quest uh, barbarian he could get a crossbow. Um, now if he if you made the change and say that the crossbowman becomes a mercenary for you for that one quest, does that mean that you never get a crossbow? I guess it'd be a trade off. You either take his crossbow or force him to join you. But you'd have 75 gold coins plus whatever treasure card searches you get. So you could get, you know, 200 some. I think it's 250. Uh, so you'd have to check. But, I mean, you could search every room for treasure once and get uh, some cards. And so you'd have, you know, a good amount of, of gold. I think in the other stream I made a mistake. I said, oh, you can never buy a toolkit. Actually, you would have enough to buy a toolkit potentially and you'd have a um, long sword i think originally they said uh, broadsword but since he's already got a broadsword why would you get two so they changed it to long sword i think that was the right decision but yeah once you get here you're still gonna need some help because yeah you've got the long sword your armor is let's see do you have any armor at this point again we're assuming that it's a brand new player 
A shield. Okay, so you'd have a shield. So you'd have three defense. That again, that's assuming you find it. Um, you, you'll have a sh so you'll have three defense, three attack, and a diagonal three attack, and potentially a crossbow. Crossbow, so three ranged attack. So you know he's getting stronger. And of course, the barbarian has eight body points, so he's pretty tough anyway. As long as he's not getting hit by magic, because he only has two mind points for magic resistance. Uh, potion of warmth, so that'll restore two lost body points from ice damage, which you'd get from going in there. That icy river. But yeah, here here's a big mistake. So I've talked about this before. This makes no sense, because when you enter the room, you search for treasure, you're going to find whatever is in that chest, which would be 120 gold coins. But these traps do nothing, because... The mechanic is you don't have to move up to the treasure chest to, to search it or to open it. So you could just go in and go out and those traps will never affect you. Obviously, they were thinking that you'd have to move up to the chest. And yes, as Stryker pointed out, if you put one monster in the room, you're not able to search until that monster is gone. So you'd be at the mercy of those spear traps. So I guess what they were thinking is you're going to jump over the spear traps or disarm every single one of them, which you can't unless you already have a toolkit and a toolkit's only 50% chance of disarming. But what they should have done instead is just make that an orange treasure chest, just put a trap on the chest itself. Meaning if you didn't buy a toolkit, you're basically risking that trap hitting you. And if you just make it just getting a little throat lozenge here, not meant as an advertisement. Just a little dry. Um it's my secret to my success here on this stream. Thanks to everybody who support us, by the way. So we're small, but we're growing steadily. Uh, we're not quite up to um, 50 followers yet, subscribers, but please uh, do follow us if you enjoy the stream, support. And if you've got a stream uh, channel, I'd be happy to check out and support you, especially if it's on a similar topic. Yeah, so they should have just put the trap on there. Let's say make it a spear trap. Um, and then if he's got a toolkit, he can try to disarm it and just get rid of those orange squares. Now I'm going to show you one of these. Um, now I'm, again, I'm being careful that I'm not trying to spoil anything for um, the uh, unreleased packs. But I did get permission to show you some of the stuff. So this is Phoenix's version. Pretty nice, pretty clean, but again, editorial changes some mistakes all right there this is from luca pashi's notes isn't that cool so they did not photocopy uh the quests instead they um just drew it out like this so this is just an example of like what one of them looks like where they let's see which quest is it um I'm not even sure which one that is. Originally, it was called Barbarian Blades, believe it or not. Barbarian Blades rather than the Frozen Horror. So I'm not even sure which quest that is. Let me just see if I can figure out. Oh, yeah. that's This is Solo Quest 1. Okay. So again, I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes here. Uh, Luca Pashi was cool with us talking about this. Um, I'm not the only one that's seen this. But yeah, it looks more or less what we saw in the final version. Let me take a look at, yeah, this is, that's Phoenix's version. So as you can see, so IG for Ice Gremlin or Ice Goblin, Weapons Rack. Pretty close, right? Pretty similar. They still had the Yeti there, so they obviously didn't catch that problem. They were going to put it in different colors. Obviously, that didn't happen. Yeah, I think mainly what they added... Well, there's the Wandering Monster Trap, so they already had it in this draft, this particular draft. Again, I'm, I'm relying on Phoenix here, but he did a pretty good job. Um, obviously that, so those gray areas are solid rock. Those aren't really rooms. 
and they just use dashed lines, hatch marks. So it's pretty pretty much the same as the final version. I'm not noticing any differences. But yeah, that was one of the later revisions. So if we look at an earlier draft version, so Barbarian Blades, classic. So this one, I'm just going to compare on my own here to the Again, these are these are from the notes. So cutting room floor stuff. Um, they changed this room with the slippery ice. They made a couple adjustments to like where where the bad guy was supposed to be. So the bat in the final version, the bad guy's there in the corner. Let's see. Yeah, it's pretty pretty similar. The what got the wandering monster traps already. I'm just looking for any changes. I mean, mostly I I noted uh, when there were changes that I that I noticed for things. Oh yeah, one thing I wanted to say real quick. So some spells were different. You notice how they um, I was mentioning the. Um, the uh, potion of icy strength allowed you to throw monsters around and basically stun them, cause them to lose a turn, essentially, uh, in the original version. And then they just change it to, oh, it's just two extra uh, or double damage, basically, from your attack. Um, one other thing was there was a chaos spell and a spell scroll that the heroes could use called Melt, which is not in the final version. It was in the cutting room floor. Melt allowed the user to melt a hole in a wall and pass through into the next room. So basically it was just like pass through rock. Pass through rock allows you to walk through walls, but only on that turn. And then the, you know, it closes up behind you. So no one can follow you. They took it out because they said, this is going to mess up the quests. Now I thought, why would that be the case? Because pass through rock is always with you, you know, either the wizard has it or the elf has it. And except for in these solo quests, of course, because you don't have them yet. But why would it mess up the quest? I mean, if you walk into solid rock and you end your turn there, you're dead. You're just, you're wiped out. So now it's up to Zargon to warn the player, hey, by the way, just so you know, you're in solid rock. So do you want to use the rest of your movement to get out of here? <laughs> you know? Sorry, <clears throat> just getting a little uh, choked up thinking about those heroes, you know, trapped in solid rock. Just kidding. Oh man. Um. <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, dry in here. Sorry, everybody. But yeah, I guess they're thinking that uh, if you have this melt spell, then the bad guy is going to be able to get himself somewhere. And I mean, he's not going to walk into solid rock, but it could mess up the quest. So maybe make. Make it so the bad guy can't be followed. So it's kind of too bad they took out the melt spell and spell scroll, but that's another cutting room floor thing that was left out. So yeah, back to the quests here. Again, I just wanted to share this, those things because not everybody can look at this stuff, and I'm just trying to notice things that were different. It interests me. It's, it's like a historical study. So again, more spoilers here. Barbarian quest back, Frozen Horror. So, uh, yeah, so again, we've got a problem of the Yeti in quest, Solo Quest 2. There's no way that he can be rescued from that with the default rules. <laughs> there were a lot of funny jokes. So all of these boss guys that you, that you meet, these named characters, they made jokes about them in the draft notes. I'm going to share some of them. I mean, it's all family friendly, so it'd be all right. Because really, I think there was only four people working on these quests. Um, might have been an extra editor, I don't know, but probably only four people. So, let's see, draft one. Oh yeah, in draft two at the end. So the original version, skip right to the end, you basically get the conclusion, every hero gets a thousand gold coins as a reward. I think that's right. So in total, you'd have four thousand gold coins if you all survived. Yeah, pretty awesome, right? 
which implies that there's another quest after this, that these weren't the last quests meant to be played. But, you know, it could be custom quests next. Or it could be maybe use the gold for your next uh, adventure, play in another one of the packs. Or it could be just like victory points. You know, yeah, you get to retire on all this great gold that you got. Or whatever. Um, but the original version, it's, they said only 350 gold per hero. So, okay, that's uh, seven. So it's 1,400 for the four, which is not a lot for this. I mean, I think they made the right decision increasing it that much because it really is a really tough pack, even though it's only 10 quests instead of 14. Oh, yeah, and in the draft two at the end, they said free frozen yogurt for all. <laughs> that was pretty funny. It's a nice little uh, joke. As the drafts went on, they, they started throwing more jokes in there. Yeah, melt. No good. Could cause serious problems in a quest. So they ended up getting rid of the melt spell and they replaced it with the mind attack. Mind blast from the elf pack is what they wanted. And it, that ended up being mind freeze. Now they don't say in here. So there's a new rule about, so with mind points, when a hero reaches zero mind points, now this is new for this pack, Elf Quest pack at the same thing, but I think in Keller's Keep, if your mind points went to zero, you basically just died. So unless you had the Elixir of Life, you couldn't come back. In Return of the Witch Lord, if they went to zero, you were unconscious for the quest. So I guess someone else has to win and drag your body out of there, and then you're in the next quest, you're fine. But in these two, they say, and presumably Wizard and Dwarf as well, um, he's not dead, but in shock. A hero cannot go below zero mind points. He rolls one red die to move. He attacks with only one combat die. So his movement and his default attacker cut in half. Well, I guess default attack is with no weapons would be one combat die. Or like the wizard with the dagger or staff. He defends with only two combat dice, so that's default. Armor, weapons, and most artifacts do not increase the attack or defend dice when a hero is in shock. The hero's attack and defend dice can be temporarily increased by some spells or spell scrolls. Extra mind points are gained from certain artifacts, such as the Talisman of Lore, can be lost in battle. For example, a barbarian with the Talisman of Lore for a total of three mind points goes into shock after he accumulates three mind points of damage. In this and other quest packs, it is important to keep track of hero's current mind points. Tell the hero to use the bottom row of body point boxes on their character sheets to record mind point damage. What they don't say in here is once a hero's in shock, how does he get back? How does he return to his normal state? Yeah, in between quests he would, because all his mind points come back. But can he do that in the quest? So yes, uh, with these posts, uh, with these potions here, any er, potion of rejuvenation, any potion, or er, any hero who drinks this bright yellow liquid gains up to six lost body points. Okay, well that's just like a healing potion. Potion of Battle Rage grants him two extra attacks per turn. Okay. It's only for the Barbarian. Potion of Icy Strength we also talked about already. Potion of Frost Skin. There's no way to get him back. But if you're playing the Elf or... Well, not the Elf because you wouldn't have it. But let's say you've got Keller's Keep or Turn of the Witch Lord, right? So let's uh, let's pull that up for illustration purposes here. So here, a quest by Phoenix. Again, he does a pretty good job with these. So let's look at, let's just take Keller's Keep. Okay, so again, this is Phoenix's recreation. So obviously he's done some little uh, tweaks and artwork, you know, enhancements to it. So this is, uh, sorry, I didn't have it on the screen there. This is a Phoenix's version of Keller's Keep. But it's the same, it's the same alchemist shop as Return of the Witch Lord. So it's exactly the same as far as content. So Potion of Restoration, right there. Restore one lost body point and one lost mind point. So what if somebody, because they say that you're supposed to be able to buy stuff from other alchemist shops from any pack that you own so or if you had it saved from a previous quest 
So if he uses one of these, does he get, get out of shock? The rules don't say. I'd say, sure, he should be able to, but they, they didn't clarify it. Because these are really hard quests, and if you're in shock, uh, you're not gonna you're not gonna be alive much longer, probably. Now, what if the hero dies, but you bring him back with a potion or unused um, healing spell, or bring him back with the elixir of life? Does he come back with his full stuff back, uh, his mind points, or is he still in a state of shock when he's alive again? They don't answer it. There's that potion of dexterity I mentioned earlier, which would be invaluable with jumping um, pits. Now, it doesn't let you jump other types of traps, but okay, so in that case, yeah, spear trap, stalactite trap, axe trap, you're not going to be able to jump it, but you can jump a pit. So if it's a pit, but you can only use one per turn. Potion of battle rage, or no, potion of battle, venom antidote. Yeah, so the, the potion of restoration could help. In the elf quest pack, I believe there's one... Well, let's double check. Because again, the Elf Quest pack is not confirmed for re release yet. And I'm thinking if the Barbarian Quest pack is a huge flop, maybe they won't do it. <laughs> maybe they'll think twice. So I'm hoping it'll be successful. And I'm hoping they'll listen to the fans as far as the fixes are concerned. So let's look at, again, Phoenix's version of the elf quest pack now again if you want to look online you can find um, yeah actually let's just do that let's do it the official way let's look up instead of the frozen horror let's look for hero quest mage of the mirror quest book in your favorite search engine hasbro yep mage of the mirror All right, so this is there. This has been out since the 90s. Anybody can pull this up free. You don't have to have the actual book yourself. And I think it's good that they include the instructions because, you know, you're a parent, you're, or you're digging out your old game, you got it at a garage sale, and all the instructions aren't there. How are we supposed to figure this out? How, we have to go on Reddit or something? It's like, no, here it is. And let's see here. So this is the elf quest just to show you that you know the scans i've got are legit as far as the content this again this is mage of the mirror this is the elf quest pack i'm sure that this would be the next one they would be looking at where's the alchemist shop you know what i think they may have goofed up here because they forgot to scan it ha they did they forgot Okay, well, uh, somebody should report that to Hasbro because where's the alchemist shop? <laughs> okay, well, contrary then to what you might have thought, there were potions in the... I never realized this. I've looked at this before and I never realized it. So the Elf Quest pack, there were potions for that pack. So let's, let's, let's see. Here's where the fans have done a better job than the official company. Okay, so here's what you should have seen there. Uh, Potion of Recall, uh, the elf regains a spell that was cast earlier during the current quest. Now it's fairly expensive, 400 gold. Potion of Speed, it's different than the Potion of Speed from um, the remake because that Potion of Speed was from the European Treasure deck, so this is different. This is only for the elf. Gives him two attacks per turn, 12. Potion of Vision, oh, okay, here we are. Potion of Restoration, this is different than the other Potion of Restoration. Some fans have titled it the Potion of Greater Restoration. <laughs> potion of Lesser Restoration, Greater Restoration. It gives you all your body and mind points back. And if you're a, a werewolf, it'll turn you back to normal. Yeah, that's a thing. We can talk about that in a later stream, future stream. But yeah, so let's say you had a Potion of Restoration. That'd be another way. Potentially, you could get out of shock, but since the rules don't clarify, is he just in shock forever until the next quest? What's the deal? So, all right. So back to the uh, Barbarian quest pack. 
I hope this is as interesting for you as it is for me, because I, I love this. I, I love dig, digging into the, uh, the prehistory of these uh, quest packs. Welcome to... Oh, I thought we had a new person join. Yeah. So, all right. So here we are on HeroQuest fans. We're still talking about the Barbarian Quest pack. All right. So back to the spoilers here. <clears throat> Spoilers from 1992. <laughs> yeah, and in the design notes, they they put uh, you know copyright Milton Bradley 1991, and then they change it to 92. So I don't know if that means that they were working on it back then and they were going to release it, or if it's just an oversight. Like maybe it was still 1991 when they were working on it, but by 93, I mean they had pretty much canceled it. And I heard that they actually even destroyed a lot of the stock, like a lot of the unsold copies. I mean, some people that like worked for the company got the prototype stuff, and but a lot of it was destroyed, which is unfortunate. I mean, it would have been cooler if they like donated it to children's hospitals or you know whatever, give it to the Salvation Army, whatever. But that's just corporate policy. So I'm sure a lot of collectors would have paid a lot. I mean, I guess collectors are happy when the stock of nostalgic stuff is destroyed because that means their copies are worth even more because there's fewer of them out there. But this won't cause any problems because it's, I mean, there's no way you're going to get the remake confused with the original. So people can still sell those for whatever, whatever they want, essentially. Whether you agree or not. So yeah, Quest 2 is pretty, pretty difficult. And so, let's see, where do you start? Um, yeah, you start here. So yeah, if you're watching this... <laughs> When you're Zargon, if you want to rearrange the quest, I'm sure nobody will object. Because, uh, I mean, I can't memorize this stuff, but some people some people have better memories. You know? or, or maybe you were Zargon last time and you're playing as the heroes this time, and so you want it to be more of a surprise, so you rearrange it. So you start here, and you exit here. So you go boom, 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 boom. So it's going to be a little while before you get to that yeti, but again, barbarian by himself, if he encounters that yeti, he's going to be in big trouble. And yeah, he has to go there to fight this guy. So you're going to have to face the yeti before you get there. Now you're going to have a crossbow. You might be able to take him out before you take any damage, but if you do take any damage, you're going to get caught in that hug attack and again by default rules you're 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 uh SOL as they say. So you get a potion of warmth, 120 gold coins, plus whatever you get from the treasure deck. That's it. So quest three, solo quest three, spoiler fix spoilers, the rescue. So this one you gotta find Gothar. Gothar of the Hill People? Or the no, that was Lothar, uh, Mike Myers from back in the day. Okay, so Gothar, they changed his stats a lot. He's one of these tribal elders, you gotta find him. I think originally he had he attacked with two and he had three body points um so they played around with his stats quite a bit originally it's like you rescue him and he would fight for you like he would be as strong as the barbarian which is cool but then they they said well no he's supposed to be a frail old man so he's more just a guy to protect and if you get greedy and try to search for treasure um you know after you find him and he gets killed well you deserve it well they changed that too they said that Basically, he's auto if the Barbarian dies, Gothar is automatically captured. And the monsters only attack the Barbarian because their orders are to capture Gothar alive. So they got rid of that. So, I mean, I guess you could re-attempt the quest with a new Barbarian, or if the Barbarian is forced to flee without Gothar somehow, that he's still alive. Now they say, oh, he won't survive long under torture or in the cruel hands of the creatures of chaos. So they don't say he's being tortured explicitly. We just always assumed. Because you find him in this room with a rack, torture rack. So, you know, maybe they tone the game down a little bit, the violence. But, okay, so you start out, again, this is a solo quest. So where do you start? It's always a little bit of a ga gamble. Okay, you start in the stairway. Boom. Boom, boom, boom. Or you search for secret doors and the Yeti. <laughs> the first room, or the second room, 
if you search for treasure or search for secret doors and you go through there, you're going to get clobbered. You're going to get grabbed and hugged to death by that Yeti. So that's, that's a, that's a problem. So you could just say that room doesn't exist <laughs> or you could get rid of the Yeti or again, allow them to escape. Um, otherwise, not a lot of objections here, except let's see. 150 gold from the chest. That's not bad. There's a helmet you can get. You can find a battle axe, another 70 gold. It's not, again, just a small tweak, and it becomes a better quest. Now, after this, you finally get into the group quests. So now you've got everybody with you. Now it doesn't matter so much. But yeah, you've still got those wandering monster traps. Those were added. So if we look over, let's get our window view back. So again, I wanted to show you a little bit more of these drafts, these draft versions. So unpublished, unreleased, Barbarian Quest Pack notes from the designers, which again, thanks to Luca Pashi for these. Oh yeah, that's Phoenix again. Okay, so this, uh, I already talked about, yeah, Barbarian Blades. This was Quest 1 draft. Here's Quest 2 draft in draft form. Ice Cave entrance and exit. So I'm just going to compare on my hard copy here. Not a lot of differences. It's pretty much what you see is what you get. So this is, I think, a later draft. So it's pretty close to the final version that everybody would have. And I wouldn't be surprised if this is what the remake version looks like as well, except for release later this year, as I mentioned. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong one here. This isn't Quest 2, is it? That's Quest 1. Oh, um, yeah, these are out of order. No, they aren't. Okay, so there's, this is quest two. And here, you've got the spear traps surrounding the treasure chest. So that error was in there. They didn't notice it. They didn't really realize that that made no sense or made less sense than how the game was played up to this point. I think the only version where you actually have to walk up to a chest to open it is the Japanese edition from 1991, which we've talked about. Kudos to Hispazargon and all the people who worked on getting that thing, that translation out to everybody. I mean, they just did a fantastic job. Uh, Day Dallas and like a whole list of R&B, Bob Bob, all these people that worked on it and made it cleaned it up made it easy to read it's really great but yeah all the other versions you just search for treasure and you've got whatever's in the room whether it's in a piece of furniture or, excuse me or not um okay so yeah i'm just looking here i'm not seeing a lot of differences it's pretty much the same okay so we looked at that enough quest three from the a draft version looks pretty much the same. I mean, I might be missing it. I'm not. Yeah, the Yeti was still there. That room. So more or less, this is what we got. Wonder Monster Trap. I'm not going to look at every single one of these. Save some surprises, right? But yeah, this is just from the Frozen Horror Barbarian Quest Pack. This is not from the unreleased packs cage room okay i guess there's a slight difference here there's supposed to be an ice gremlin inside that cage but they don't really depict him here so i guess if they say so in the notes they would just say he's in there somewhere doesn't matter the exact square he's on okay now if we switch over to a different draft so these are supposed to be the revised versions so photocopy so this is the uh, first draft of the maps. So there's a couple things crossed out and changed. One symbol for all mercenaries. So the idea with the mercenaries was they 
would put a generic symbol and then Zargon gets to choose what weapon they have. But in the notes, I mean, it's clearly a crossbowman. So it doesn't really matter in that case. That's similar to the European exclusive, The Dark Company, which came with HeroQuest Advanced Quest Edition or Master Edition, not to be confused with Advanced HeroQuest, which was its own game. But that was like a bonus edition that came with 12 red mercenaries and uh, 24 weapons, I think. And there was just one really hard quest where it was like a multi-part quest. So you'd go through a door on the edge and the board would get cleared and you'd set it up again. And there were these evil humans that you would fight. It'd just be a generic symbol. So if Zargon wants it to be a crossbowman, it's a crossbowman. If he wants it to be, you know, a pikeman, whatever. That one was really hard. Still not as hard as this, though. I would say this is harder. Yeah, so again, you can see they still had the spear trap error there, the cluster of spear traps that makes little sense if you're understanding how treasure chests actually work. So I'm giving them a hard time about that one, but if they if they intended to change the rules for treasure chests and traps, they should have said so. They didn't. So... Yeah, uh, that's probably one of the bigger errors. But with gameplay, it actually works out in the hero's favor because the heroes can search for uh, treasure, get the treasure, and avoid all the traps. They don't have to even search for traps. He might not even know there's spear traps in the room as long as he moves around the outer edge. So it actually helps the heroes. But I think they intended it to be hard. Like they wanted there to be a good chance that you'd get hit before you... Uh, get the treasure so it's closer to their original intention which was to have a dangerous treasure chest to just say the trap the trap is on the chest i mean that's an easy thing to easy fix so yeah i did play test it um and when we played it it was just like well i'm just playing it as written and you get the treasure and you don't have to worry about those traps at all it's just a, a glitch an error so yeah, everything looks the same. Uh, Yeti, still there. They put little check marks. I'm not sure if they're just saying, yeah, that's good, or yeah, they're just counting up the monsters is probably what they were doing. Yeah, Barbarian Blades. So this is still an early draft, we can tell. So looking at Quest 3, again, spoiler if spoilers. Yeah, it... They didn't bother to even fill in all the solid rock that's supposed to be behind those things there. So let me show you. See, that's all supposed to be gray. Shadow is dark gray or shaded gray. Solid rock. Uh, yeah, but looking at the... Uh, Yeah, see, now there they bothered to shade it all in. Oh, okay, so it's not an exact. So they must have colored it in on the photocopy. Or that is another, like they redrew it. Yeah, it's been redrawn. They redrew the whole thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's clearly redrawn. Sorry, I'm just trying to make it a little easier to read that. I mean, it's not like you're going to print these out or anything. It's just just for reference. So, yeah, I'm just looking here, and I don't see any real differences between this and the final version that was released. Wander monster traps are there. The Yeti is still there for you to find and get killed by in the second room, potentially. So there's two ways you could go in, either through the secret door or around past the treasure chest. Because how can you turn down that room, right? If you see a door, you're going to open it because you could have something good in there. I mean, unless you're down to like one body point or something, then you might not open it. But, yeah. So, okay. So that was just kind of a, a quick look around. I can't really show you any of the other stuff again out of respect for uh, spoiler surprises with um, 
the group that's working on the unreleased quests, but I did want to just show you some of those draft notes. So pretty cool stuff. Let me just look through my notes here just to see if there's anything else I want to share with you on the stream. I do need to give my voice a rest. Tomorrow, the plan, if everything goes well, of course, because it's always, you know, anything can happen, right? Um, but the plan is to do a game, a live game, uh, tomorrow during our normal streaming time. So I'd like to do Hero Quest again, and not just because the Space Crusade streams are far less popular than the Hero Quest ones. I mean, I like Space Crusade. I think it's cool. I think it's interesting learning about it, and it is from the makers of Hero Quest. But a lot of people have no clue what Space Crusade is, and they they want to see Hero Quest on Hero Quest fans. So I can't blame them. But yes, in the design notes, they said Mike did an excellent job on the maps. I agree. It would have taken quite a bit of time to put all that on there. Let's see. Yeah, so Scott, whoever that was, he did the original. Well, I know, but yeah, Scott did the original version of the Yeti uh, rules. And I think he had a good thing going. And I think when they changed it, they they broke it. So maybe they were going to do more with it. But yeah, the his original version was better. Um, the melt spell would have been cool. So the Ring of Warmth, that's an artifact. It originally gave immunity to most cold-based effects for as long as it is worn. So they toned it down just a little bit. And the Armband of Ice is more like what the Ring of Warmth originally was. But the Armband of Ice, again, is this artifact where there's a card for it and everything, but they never give it to you in these quests. So I think it should be a reward for completing Quest 3. Because really, Solo Quest 3, I don't think there's any reward you find Gothar, and that's it. Use any available hero figure for Gothar. Place him next to the Barbarian. Gothar is under the Barbarian's control and moves after him. Yeah, there's no reward for, for finding him. It's like, don't you think the Tribal Elders would be grateful that you brought him back? Normally, they give you some gold to reward, but give him the artifact. That'd be cool. Maybe Gothar found it. Maybe while they were torturing him, he you know, uh, knew about it. Somehow he learned about its release. I mean, in the Japanese quest pack, I mean, Princess Miku or Princess Meek, she finds a talisman of lore. So she tells you where to find it. So that'd be a cool thing to do. But again, that's my, my solution. But yeah, originally Gothar could be killed. Originally he could fight for you. He was really strong. The Battle Rage potion was 500 gold and they reduced it to 400. Icy Strength was 500 they reduced it to 200 and changed completely what it does. Sorry, just had a... My throat's really dry, even though it's not that dry here. <laughs> Someone asked, how do you disarm a stalactite? Well, again, it, it's a trap, so presumably there's some mechanism. I mean, you can make up whatever you want. Um, you disarm the trigger. Um, they had something called the preservation room and the note was, I don't see this room anywhere. So I think that was just, they just changed the name to something else. Now there is something mentioned here, which I won't mention, which is going to be in the new quests, the unreleased quests. So I'll just leave that off for now. But yeah, the solo quests in the original notes, they don't have to be for a brand new hero. I guess they say that they say, well, yeah, you've only got two people. This could be a fun way to play it. So the barbarian for all we know could be loaded down with armor and weapons and potions, which aren't going to help him at all if he finds a Yeti and the Yeti does damage to him. Um, they do say in the original design notes that if you've got other quest packs, you can use assets from them in here. So not just with the alchemist shop, like you could buy other potions from other packs, but if there's, if there's other spells, other spell options from other quest packs, you can use them here. Now, it doesn't change a whole lot because only the Elf Quest pack was re officially released besides this one, Mage of the Mirror. But, I mean, in that one, the Elf doesn't have to just take one of the elemental spells and then the wizard gets the rest. In that one, he could use the Elf spells. There was, like, a collection, and he would choose three of them. And so if he used that, well, the wizard would get um, three out of the four elements. So there was air, water, fire, and earth. Usually in games, the elf would, would take either earth or water so that he'd get one healing spell, and then the wizard would have the other one so he'd get a healing spell. But potentially, 
unused spells would just be taken away by Zargon. So that was just a clarification they were originally going to put in. But since the wizard and dwarf quest packs didn't come out and they haven't remade Mage of the Mirror yet, that won't be a clarification probably in this one. Now, in theory, you could choose new spells every single quest. Like in between, in between quests, you could choose. Most The way most people play is once you choose your spells, it stays that way for the whole campaign. But it wouldn't have to be. So maybe you chose the L spells and you're like, I don't like these. Let's go back to water, earth. So in the next quest, you divide up the cards differently again between the players. So that could be a clarification. I mean, again, if they release more of these, it's going to be like, okay, we can't assume everybody owns all of them. And that seems like kind of a greedy tactic where they just, you know, oh, yeah, to make this quest better, you've got to buy all these other packs. But really, you could homebrew it pretty easily. Somebody could just go online and be like, yeah, you know, we've got these, but let's throw a potion of dexterity. Let's throw a potion of restoration in there, too, and let people use them, spend their gold on it. I mean, that's something the fan community does anyway. But even Hasbro, they they this is online for you to look at. And you can look at Mage of the Mirror. Well, except they forgot to scan that page back in the 90s. They, they should put up some new scans because really they could do it in full color. It'd look great. I mean, are they afraid someone's going to print it out? Obviously not because with the remake, they have a really good quality scan of the rule book and the quest book. And they got Return of the Witch Lord, Mage of the Mirror, or I mean, uh, Keller's Keep. Sorry, I'm starting to get confused. But they have all those up there. So, I mean, you could print it out and it'd look great. Because it's it's like free advertising. If you don't have the board game, it's going to be hard to play it. So if you just have the quest book, but you could look at it. But yeah, no uh, smartphones at the table. So that people, except for Zargon, because <laughs> you could cheat in theory. That's why you change your uh, quest around. Uh, now with the double quest, so quest 9 and 10, there's no interruption between. So no changing spells, no buying stuff at the armory, the alchemist shop, and nobody gets healed automatically. But between any other quest, whether it makes sense or not, you can go shopping with your gold. Now they did say in the designer notes that multiple monster, if you get a wandering monster trap, let's say that's multiple wandering monsters, or I guess, yeah, if, if in the quest it's multiple monsters, because they, they already do that. And this was not something that was introduced in these quests. The European quests had this before. I think against the Ogre Horde had it. So it's two skeletons. So let's say you can't put the two skeletons adjacent to the hero. That that would affect. And yeah, if you've got the Guardian Knight, he can say, oh, attack me instead of him. Instead of the one that drew it. But who has the Guardian Knight? Very few people were able to get their hands on that character. So enough said about that. But in the designer notes, they're saying, well, originally they were saying, okay, if you can't put it adjacent to the one that the target, you can put it next to the nearest hero. But really, they're only supposed to attack the one who fell victim to the wandering monster. And you just put the monsters as close as you possibly can um, in that case. Um, dividing up gold rewards, so I already talked about how they debated about that. Like, what do they mean by large? Who knows? Um, some of the designers had a problem with calling them evil humans, uh, calling them monsters, or putting them on monster cards. Because originally the mercenaries in Wizards of Morkar, they were on men-at-arms cards. So they were like good guys, you know, from the start. But there could be evil mercenaries as well. So it was like, all right, do you call them monsters or do you give them a unique card? I would not be surprised if they just followed the convention here and just used monster cards for those guys. It's kind of a minor thing. But it's like, well, wait a minute. If these are monsters, how come they're working for you? Well, they're just saying if if they're controlled by Zargon, they're considered monsters, regardless of you know what species they are. And if they work for you, they're considered mercenaries. <laughs> somebody wrote, uh, don't call us, we'll call you. Not. <laughs> so I was thinking, oh, it's a reference to Wayne's World. And it got me kind of on a uh, memory lane. So Wayne's World, Wayne's World, party time, excellent. Yeah. So Mike Myers and Dana Carvey, that's SNL skit, Saturday Night Live, from 
1988. The movie came out in 92, which is the same year this came out. But they were already talking about Wayne's World. So the Saturday Night Live skits, which inspired the, the, the two movies. The second one came out in 93. I don't, barely remember it. Um, it's okay. You know, you take a, uh, a short, you know, five-minute sketch from comedy show and you turn it into a two-hour movie or 90-minute movie it's a little little dicey but yeah uh wayne's world was actually it was called wayne's power minute from 1987 from a cbc tv series called it's only rock and roll and city tv city limits so there were like the character existed before wayne's world on saturday night live and before the movie so i didn't realize that so i guess I think I, I'm assuming Mike Myers came up with the character, you know, a guy who lives in his basement and he's obsessed with like heavy metal and making immature jokes about celebrities and stuff. And Dana Carvey's his friend and he, he gets kind of like, he gets emotional and it's just kind of goofy, but yeah, they make some Wayne's world jokes. So yeah, that wasn't Borat. That was a Wayne's world, but not, you know, after you say a joke. You say something, and I liked it not. <laughs> yeah, so it's goofy. At one point, there was, yeah, they do a lot of excellent uh, things. I guess you could say Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. That was more, you know, surfer dudes who say, excellent, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you know, that kind of thing. California guys, slang. Uh, it appears in pop culture, you know, a lot. Oh, yeah, so they had Mentor's Signature. And somebody wrote M. Bob on there. I don't know what that is. Maybe it's an inside joke. Um, yeah, they referred to the Room of Mirrors. That was changed. Oh, yeah, in Quest 8. Let me just see here. I'm, I'm not going to show it. but Because there was something in Quest 8 that they deleted. Cutting Room Floor, Quest 8. Almost done here. There was a line of dialogue. Yeah, it's not in here. There was a line of dialogue from the Frozen Horror. The Frozen Horror appears and says, Fools, I will destroy you and you will become my slaves. And the heroes try to attack him, but it's just an apparition. It's not the real Frozen Horror. He disappears in a puff of foul smoke. Yeah, so that's totally different. That was not a part of the quest at all originally let me just check ahead because i haven't played the later quests so i can't say like every detail i know in perfect clarity yeah i don't think uh it happens at all so it's just a fake out so that was left on the cutting room floor that was kind of a cool idea i mean you know there's 10 quests it's like come on it's not really him i mean well maybe i mean it's you know when you fought the the fro uh the the witch lord i mean you see him before you have the final confrontation with him. And then he comes back in another quest pack and you fight him again. Yeah, so... What, what does the dialogue mean? Does it even make sense? Why would he destroy you and then you'd become his slaves? Is he talking about like you'd come back as zombies or skeletons or mummies or something? Um, but anyway, yeah, you know, it, it was kind of a cool thing. So yeah, if you want to homebrew that, that's kind of a fun thing that you could introduce yeah the hal beer deer was called a pikeman because they were didn't understand what a hal beer deer was <laughs> somebody wrote what is this bs to uh when they were talking about the uh, entrance and exit doors normally you don't put out the final door until someone can actually do line of sight to it and someone was questioning it and they were going back and forth and they're just like what is this you know, like wrong, wrong. So I don't know if this one's getting testy, like, hey, we already clarified this, but it happens. Uh, they were kind of deciding spell scrolls. Are they counted as spells or, or not? It's like, yeah, a spell scroll is considered a spell. It's just a single use spell that anyone can use. There was a big explanation about the new spell system. I They removed a lot of references to the other quest packs. I don't know if they just, they knew that they might not come out. Or they were just good-naturedly assuming, hey, just because you bought one of these doesn't mean that you bought all of them. So you might not understand 
those other references and you couldn't rely on those when playing this. So it should be, it should be like standalone. I mean, you've got the game system and this, and that's all you need. But if you happen to have the other ones, yeah, you could use other stuff. And yeah, um, with the multiple monsters, it sounded like what they were going with was no matter how many attacks a monster has, the target only gets to defend once at the end. So if they attack with four twice, it's really like an eight dice attack and they defend once. But then if they wanted to apply that to monsters as well, that changes how Orcs Bane and Heroic Brew function. And some of these other potions that let you know the hero attack twice. I think that's an elf quest pack. So yeah, that clarification would have changed things if they'd included that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, they developed the armband of ice, but they forgot to put it in the game, apparently. And the unmarked treasure chests. I'm forgetting now which, which quest, because I think there were more of these unmarked treasure chests in the elf quest pack. But I want to say that here they were always unmarked. They always forgot. So I'm just going to look real quick. I'm going to look ahead without spoiling it all for you here. We looked at the first three quests. I mean, if the notes say the chest is empty, then it's empty. And then whoever searches first, just sorry, it's empty. But technically, the next person who searches that room will draw a card. That's how the rules work. Because each room can be searched by each hero once. So if it's a solo quest, obviously just once, but you could get a card. I mean, you could interpret it as, if the chest is empty, well, what about the rest of the room? It's not just like, oh yeah, they're going to search it. At, oh, there was a false bottom. I found something you didn't find. Okay, so I'm looking at quest four. That seems to be okay. Looking for unmarked chests. Because, yeah, I had a uh, thread about it on Yield In, but I'm just not looking at it right now. Cheers, Dead Gamer. So, yeah, if I... <laughs> I don't like to cough on this stream or anything. I'll just, like, edit it out. But, yeah, it's just a little bit dry. Not seeing any empty chests in Quest 6. Yeah, you don't get the Amulet of the North until Quest 7. Now, that's a really good artifact. It's basically just like the Elven Bracers from Mage of the Mirror. But, I mean, that one, the Elven Bracers aren't even in that quest. But that's that's a Mage of the Mirror elf quest pack uh, problem. Yeah, just because you've got a piece of furniture in the room doesn't mean that there's a special treasure in the notes. Sometimes they just forgot to put something or they just didn't. And so that just means you draw a card. Because you're not searching each piece of furniture individually. You're searching the entire room. You don't have to move or anything. You just search. You're searching everything. All right, still looking. Sorry, let's go back to the um, at least give you something something interesting to look at here while I'm looking through this. Let's go back to Phoenix here. Uh, there we go. Well, that's the elf. It's the elf again. Here's the Barbarian quest pack. It's all upside down, I know. Yeah, so there's the original text of the Frozen Horror. You just look at that there. So I think the Elf quest pack had more issues, like more mistakes. The problem with the Barbarian quest pack is basically the Yeti... Um, and then the lack of the um, armband of ice, no reward for quest three. Quest 
the first three quests are really hard, but you're still controlling a barbarian. So other than the Yeti problem, it's not so bad as the elf quests. They're just ridiculous. But yeah, once you get past the solo quests in both of these packs, you're going to be you're going to be okay, I think. Generally speaking. Oh yeah, they made a big deal about I think quest 8, there was like no way to get into the room. So they they figured out a way to do that. So it made sense. Um Yeah, whenever you see a treasure chest and there's no letter in the room, then it's a problem. Oh, okay, okay. Quest 9. Here it is. Okay, so spoilerific spoilers. Uh, I'm gonna have to show you my crafting there. Okay, so quest nine. See that? There's a treasure chest. It's heavily guarded, and there's no note. There's no letter. There should have been a letter there. So what would you put in it? Uh, if I were Zargon, I would put. Let's see. We've got a. Where's B? Got A, C, E, D. Oh, the living fog room. Yeah, there's just no note at all. So I would say probably it should be like the elixir of life or healing potions. Maybe a couple of healing potions in there because you're going to really need it. Because remember, this is the two part quest. So you can't. So Zargon, quests 9 and 10 are actually one double-sized quest. Notes A through F refer to the quest 9 map. Notes G through M refer to the quest 10 map. The heroes will be moving back and forth between these two quests. Mining and body points are not restored when the heroes cross between quests 9 and 10. Reset the game board as described in note A at right when the heroes cross between quests. Okay, tell the players that they cannot enter quest 10 until all the heroes... have moved onto the stairway. Once all heroes have moved onto the stairway, remove quest nine set up from the board. When the heroes return to quest nine, set out only room A until they explore other rooms. Monsters they killed previously do not reappear. Now they don't say treasure that you found previously is not gone. I think that's what they intended, but because that's how that's how a dark company worked. You clear the board, you come back. Well, no, I guess it's totally different because in dark company, when you come back, all the monsters are back, but the treasure that you found is not back. Here it says the monsters don't come back, but it doesn't even mention the treasure. So yeah, they could clean that up a little bit. Zargon has to keep track of what they've done in the previous quest because you, you don't have two boards. You just got one board. Okay, so there is a miss, uh, empty chest that's not even marked in Quest 9. I mean, I guess the fact that it's not marked... I mean, you could put the armband of ice in there. I mean, it's kind of late in the game to be giving them that. But I think you should give it to them in Quest 3. Yeah, it makes more sense. But that's up to Hasbro what, if they're going to do anything. If they just leave it as is, they're basically inviting the GM to just do whatever. But it's like, there's a treasure chest, just nothing. If you play this as is, this would mean just draw a card. So it's just a piece of background. It could be anything. <clears throat> and then quest 10, let me see if they made any mistakes here with the treasure chest. Because again, I'm forgetting. There's a treasure chest, but it is marked. Yeah, so it's really just that one. So anyway, um, that's, uh, that's the Frozen Horror. And I didn't go through every single thing, but it was fun reading the notes. So we've got quite a few things here. And I, I think Luca Pashi might have some more... Oh, yeah, a few more jokes. Yeah, the Scepter of Glacial Majesty was originally called the Scepter of Glacial Eminence. That's this thing that you got to find and break. And they said, well, you find it and destroy it. Um, charts. Somebody said, are you going to redesign them? <laughs> Who's going to redesign them? Not us. And somebody like came back with a wisecrack that was a little rude. Uh, his nickname is Popsicle. 
Oh, okay. So Gothar, they said his nickname is Pop Sickle. It's like Popsicle because he's like Pops, like he's an old guy. All right. Yeah, originally he had two body and four mind. Oh, yeah, they, they clarified in the design notes. They said, well, there's hardly any spell scrolls, and we can't assume that people playing this have all the other um, quest packs that have spell scrolls, again, just like the potions thing. So when you draw a spell scroll, because you separate them out, and it says draw a random card from that set of artifacts. So you write it on your character sheet, and you put the card back. So you could get it the same one again, potentially, because there's, there's so few. So that was a that was a nice clarification. Uh, a couple of people were just like, "Well, what is the Frozen Horror really?" So they might not have had the miniature yet. What what is he? So is the Frozen Horror an Eskimo pie gone berserk? <laughs> um, what is the Frozen Horror? Oh yeah, Vilor was one of these bad guys, one of these bosses that you fight. Um, after his stats, someone wrote, "He can also say the alphabet backwards." So what? That's like one of those field sobriety tests that like police will do if they pull you over and think you might be intoxicated. <laughs> you can sell it, say the alphabet backwards. So probably an inside joke. Um, they talked about how oh the 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 entrance exit doors should be like uh, refrigerator doors. <laughs> That'd be a cool homebrew. The refrigerator doors. And then someone said, "Too bad refrigerator Perry couldn't be in this quest." For Kelvinos, another of these characters, uh, after listing all his stats and all the spells he's got, he said, he has a frost-free freezer and an automatic ice cube maker. Now, there's a question about the scepter. They were saying, well, what if the heroes find it and they're like, why don't we try to use it? It's like they never came up with a, something other than to say, well, no, 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 only Zargon could use it. Because there's heroes are supposed to try to destroy it. But if they just said, well, what if we try to use it? What if we try to use the Ring of Power against uh, uh, Sauron, you know, Lord of the Rings? Um, someone wrote, how come we left out uh, Tom Carvel and the Dairy Queen from this quest pack? Now, Tom Carvel, I had to look him up because I'm like, who is that? So he was big in the 70s. He is credited with the being the inventor of soft serve ice cream. I kid you not. And he had this uh, ice cream fortune. So all the soft serve ice cream shops you see like credited to his method of they, you put air into the ice cream and mix it up in the machine and it comes out soft instead of hard. So that's cool. Um, and then, of course, Dairy Queen is a big uh, ice cream chain, frozen treats and hot eats, depending on where you are in the country. But yeah, Tom, Tom Carvel's um, stuff. So they had these ice cream cakes. I had to look this up, too. But Fudgy the Whale, if you've ever heard of Fudgy the Whale, that's uh, an ice cream cake design that they had at these uh, franchise locations. And uh, not Dairy Queen, but Tom Carvel's uh, stuff. And then there was Fudgy the Whale and there was um, Cookie Puss, which I was like, Cookie Puss, isn't that like something that in WWE The Rock referred to um, CM Punk as Cookie Puss? And people were like, what? Well... That's another one of these ice cream cakes where it's got like, uh, I think Oreo cookies for eyes. It's like a clown and the nose has a, like a, the nose is a, a, an ice cream cone, like the cone, uh, sugar cone. It's kind of goofy, but yeah, if you look it up, I mean, hopefully that those are the results you get. But yeah, Cookie Puss, it was a real like cartoon design for an ice cream cake. There's Fudgy the Whale, and then it's Huggy, was it Huggy the Bear, or Hugs the Bear, or something like that. But yeah, they were popular in the 70s, and they're probably still around. You probably have to look around for them, but you could probably get an ice cream cake in some parts of the country, still. But yeah, Dairy Queen is still around, too. Dairy Queen is different stuff. Another joke... You can tell, you know, there's there's stress working on a project like this. I'm sure they were rushed. I'm sure they didn't get enough time. They didn't get enough manpower to get the project done because they only released two of the four quest packs. And you saw, you know, the issues that they've had in the ones that were released. So, I, you know, I kind of feel for them. But, you know, they're trying to break the, break the ice or, you know, teasing each other and, uh, you know, making jokes. 
<laughs> so the heroes get 350 gold coins each for completing the, the, the 10 quests in the original version. Later, they'd get 1,000 each. But they said uh, 350 gold coins and a case of frozen yogurt. <laughs> Um, the originally it said the frozen horror returned once more when the forces of good thought it dead and it may re well return again and somebody else wrote well not while i'm still working here <laughs> so just kind of funny there not while i'm still working here so that person is not still working there i assume because we are getting the frozen horror again in the remake this year uh, and then for the original text, it says, I, uh, for mentor, I fear many long, weary battles lie still ahead of you. And someone wrote bummer <laughs> on there. So originally the mercenary crossbowman, it was only two attack dice at range, but they changed it to three. And they also said, well, what if he wants to attack adjacently? Well, he should have a broadsword. So they clarify that he's got a broadsword, so he attacks with three adjacently. I think that should be in here. Yeah. When adjacent to a foe, the crossbowman attacks with the broadsword. Because, as you recall, the crossbow, there has to be at least one square away. Like, it can't. you can't use it to attack adjacent targets. It's got to be ranged targets. And yes, there was always the debate, which they never clarified, from the North American version. Can you hit those four diagonal squares? So let's say, let's say the barbarian. Pretend that's not the yeti. So say that that's the barbarian. If he's right here, can he hit this square, this square, this square, and that square? Or can he only hit like one square away? Some people say he can hit those four diagonals. I would say no. And if you look at the Japanese version, they clarified it there, but they didn't clarify any of the other versions. So they're just people are just left to contemplate what they think. But I think if you if you say the crossbow can hit those four diagonals, um, northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest, then it's like why would you ever buy a, a longsword? Because it would be able to do what the longsword does. I well, I guess it wouldn't hit north south east and west but yeah anyway so yeah that would be a nice clarification they didn't clarify it in the remake game system so they probably won't clarify that here we'll see yeah so mike g if you look at these notes they reference mike g a lot he was the editor everything had to be cleared past him so people were getting kind of annoyed they're like oh i gotta ask him again for this he's got to go over it but, you know, he, he would have to review everything. So that's a lot of work for one person in a short amount of time. Um, oh, yeah. And more jokes. The East German judge gives Zargon a perfect 10 on his skating performance. How about Dick Button as a monster? So, yeah, Dick Button, uh, known in the figure skating, ice skating world, professional skaters, because there's a skate spell and skate spell scroll. They were talking about that. Okay, and then melt spell. A spell melts a small hole in the wall of a room or corridor, enabling the spellcaster to pass through the wall. Only the spellcaster may pass through. The hole freezes over once the spellcaster has passed through. So that was a deleted spell. Uh, originally, the warmth spell heals all mind points. And they changed that to say no. Um, it heals three lost body points, and they said, okay, it only heals two if it was due to cold damage, and one if it was due to any other type of damage. And they instead made Psychic Recovery as the spell scroll that brings back mind points. Is that in the, the Frozen Horror, though? Let me just double check, because I'm forgetting. So for this, I'm going to have to jump over to Yield In. just look because i don't have it memorized i don't have all the cards out in front of me either but i just want to see if there was any artifacts that restore mind points in the frozen horror so for treasure you've got two instances of the potion of warmth 
because you actually add these to the treasure deck. Two instances of the Potion of Magic Resistance. So any damage causing spell you can recover from. Two instances of Poison. Artifacts, yes. Spell Scroll, Psychic Recovery. So now this is... Um, Okay, I'm just going to read it off. So, Spell Scroll of Psychic Recovery, which could be one of your random ones. There's four, there's only four Spell Scrolls. There's Chill, Ice Storm, and Ice Bridge, which are normally chaos spells, but the heroes can use them if they find these. Psychic Recovery, this spell restores all lost mind points to the spellcaster or any one hero the spellcaster chooses. Scroll comes to dust once used. So, again... Why didn't they clarify this? Does this mean that if you're in shock and you use psychic recovery or have psychic re recovery used on you, do you get out of shock? They don't say. So you can have the generous interpretation and say, yes, they're, they make a full recovery and all their abilities are restored. Or you take the hard line and say, it doesn't say that that happens, so they stay in shock. And I guess you just wasted it. Yeah, it wouldn't make much sense because it's like, okay, now your your mind points are positive rather than zero, and yet you're still in shock, like until the next quest. Because everything else just temporarily raises your mind points. But, yeah. So I would say, yeah, the Potion of Restoration or the um, Psychic Recovery ought to um, bring you out of shock, but they don't clarify. So that'd be nice if they did. Someone wrote, uh, Potion of Magic Resistance. This is an exception to when you can use potions only on your turn. I think technically, and I would disagree with them, I would say you're led to believe that you can use a potion anytime. It's not considered an action to drink a potion. So you can you could do it on Zargon's turn. You could do it on another hero's turn. You don't have to wait till your turn to use it. Now they do make it sound like when you're passing a potion to another hero that you're adjacent to, only the one whose turn it is is allowed to pass. Um, so it's not like two heroes are next to each other and they can just pass back and forth. Now, it'd be interesting to see if they clarify that because I think in the new quest that Hasbro released for free online called New Beginnings, they make it sound like you could potentially do that. But if they release this, they're going to say only on your turn can you pass. In fact, I think that's clarified pretty early on. Rule clarifications... Passing items. A hero can pass a potion, artifact, weapon, or any other item to another hero only if the two heroes are in adjacent squares and neither hero is adjacent to a monster. Well, that doesn't say on, the, on their turn. But I'm pretty sure in the original uh, game system, see, <laughs> when you get into the minutia of it, it's like, yeah, Zargon could just decide, sure, you can do it, you can do it. I'll be generous. But how did they intend the original game to be played? I'm curious now. Now I'm going to trust uh, Phoenix's version here because I don't want to pull out my box and dig through to find my original copy. So let's just look at his and say... I know you can't see this, but I'm just going to look in Passing Potions. I mean, you can certainly pass items from one hero to another. That's not in doubt. The question is, when and how was it defined in the North American version? I know how to find it. I do like uh, Phoenix's recreations because you can easily do a text search, whereas you can't do that when it's just a photocopy or scan. Yeah, getting caught in a trap, drinking potions, and picking things up do not count as actions. It can be done any time during your turn. Because, yeah, you don't pour a potion onto the person's head. You you give it to them, and then they use it. They drink it. But if you get killed by a monster, 
and you have a potion in your possession that heals you, you just use it automatically, even though it's not your turn, to bring yourself back from death, which is something you could not do in the European version. Okay. As a hero, you may... Okay, this is the, this is the uh, game system rule book, or inst instructions, booklet, rules of play, whatever you want to call it. As a hero, you may drink a potion at any time. The way a potion works and how long its effects last are listed on the potion treasure card and sometimes in the quest book. You may drink more than one potion at a time. There you go. Healing potions are very valuable. If your body points are reduced to zero, you may drink a healing potion before you die and save yourself by restoring one or more of your body points. You may give one of your potions to a fellow hero, but you may do so only on your turn. <laughs> now, you could take that super strict and say only one per quest, but it sounds like one potion per turn can be passed. So there you go. So the, the intention from the original game was to do it that way. Now, again, these are just the guides. So if you play the game differently, I mean, great. That's that's how you do it. But this is what they intended. Now, who hasn't homebrewed HeroQuest? Pretty much everybody that plays it homebrews it in some way or another. So I'm not here going to point fingers and say you're doing it wrong. You play how you want to. But I think if Hasbro makes it clear, clarifies some of these rules so that people who are just starting out who don't want to go through all that homebrew stuff and revise. I mean, it's a lot of people consider that, you know, it's like homework. Like, I just want to play the quest. This is different than Dungeons & Dragons or some other game where there's all this extra prep time. Like, I don't want to troubleshoot this. I just want to pick it up and play it. So if they make it nice and easy for people who are just getting started, I think it'll be it'll be pretty popular. It'll help. It'll be help, help it be successful, and that means potentially they're going to make more high-quality stuff for the fans. Because, I mean, yeah, we survived for three decades as a community with no new HeroQuest releases, no support from the parent company. We can do it again, but what a shame to waste that if they don't build that goodwill, continue to have faith in the product. So, anyway, it's my little soapbox there. But yeah, that's pretty much the end of the stream. Uh, let me just double check and make sure there weren't any questions. Anybody had anything they wanted to ask? Because I'll answer if I can about these uh, draft notes, cutting room floor stuff. Anybody have any questions? Frozen horror questions, anyone? And thank you to everyone who listened to the stream thus far. I know it went kind of long here. Let's see. Yeah, this was a longer stream. I mean, yeah, I did talk about some craft stuff at one point. I did a little aside there. But, yeah, I, I wanted to do a thorough walkthrough of the drafts, again, without stepping on any toes, without showing you too much spoiler type stuff because a lot of that stuff is only being shared with a couple of people i mean luca pashi has control of the documents so whatever he decides to share with us or with the public is kind of what we've been doing and, and it's basically like yield in and a couple other places that facebook i think people have seen some of the stuff eventually it'll all come out but for now it's just i just wanted to express uh, that stuff so you kind of know what's going on so yeah, thank you to Impressiona, Impressi, Impressiona, Impressiona, and Alien Gathering. Welcome to HeroQuest fans. So we just got talking about done talking about this. So it looks like we've been going about three hours and ten minutes. No wonder my voice is uh, kind of hoarse, but yeah, I think it'll be an interesting to see how the release goes. But like I said, I pledged on here that if this is not a retail release, the remake, I'm not going to buy it. I'm going to wait until it comes a retail release and if it ends up on hopefully it does not but if it ends up like the commander of the guardian knights hero collection i'm just not going to have it because i mean avalon hill apologized they said look we didn't realize how excited people were for this stuff we didn't the the agreement they entered into they didn't have enough stock 
they just totally underestimated the demand. So hopefully they've learned their lesson and this game, this Barbarian Quest Pack remake, this Frozen Horror, will come to retail and it'll be just like Keller's Keep or Turn the Witch Lord in the game system. You'll be able to just walk into a store or just order it from a regular retail store and you won't have to worry about, you know, trying to go on eBay or whatever. I'm trying to track it down for an absurd price. It's just silly. So, okay. That, um, I don't think we had any questions. So, in that case, we're just going to go ahead and end the stream. And like I said, I will be uploading this to YouTube uh, as soon as possible. Thanks to everybody who joins us on the Discord. You can also hit us up on Yield In. But yeah, XSC3, Home of HeroQuest fans on YouTube. Um, give us a subscribe, like, comment, <laughs> ring the bell for notifications. You know, they always say that, all that stuff. But it's true. Thanks for your support. All right. Take care, everybody. Stay warm. <laughs>